Are we live? All right. First and foremost, we give all praises, honor, and glory unto the Most High God, Yahweh. We do so in the name of His only begotten Son, who the world calls Christ, Yahweh Shai. It's your brother, Chief Priest Alazar Ben Loy, get a gorilla Hebrew. I'm joined by Sergeant Yatab, Zakari Seattle, Officer Hassan Karab. And, um, ladies and gentlemen, if y'all remember a couple years ago, we did something and, and it was legendary through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shemi Yahweh Shai. Unfortunately, um, it's, it was taken off YouTube. I don't know where to find it. All right. But it's called the roast of James White. All right. If you were there, you remember it. You remember how classic it was. And you saw an alleged doctor and scholar of theology get totally decimated by a high school dropout convicted felon. All right. Through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shemi Yahweh Shai. You saw it. All right. Um, we're going to do something similar tonight by the grace of the most high. Um, and that is roast. Uh, another doctor of theology, um, a brother who goes by the name of Dr. Eric Mason of Epiphany Fellowship, the spearhead or the forerunner of the movement known as the Woke Church. Uh, we, we've done videos and we've had actual interactions with the brother uh, live and direct uh, in the streets of Dallas, Texas. Um, you know, we've done a couple on him, but he had the nerve and the unmitigated gall to do a video, a, a lecture, a two and a half hour lecture at his church that he put on his YouTube channel um, just days ago. I'm talking about what, what uh, uh, April 29th, so literally yesterday? Yeah, it's yesterday. Yeah, oh, yesterday, yesterday. just yesterday. 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 Yeah. yesterday. Called Engaging Hebrew Israelites. It is supposed to be some form of a guide um, to Christians on how to deal with Hebrew Israelites. Teaching them how to lie. That's all. There you go. Teaching them how to lie and continue the lie that the white man taught them while semi-acknowledging that the white man has done wrong to them. It's crazy, right? Um. So that's what this is. So we're going to analyze this through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai. We're going to analyze it. We're going to deal with it. We're going to analyze it. We're going to deal with it. Um. <laughs> There, there's, there's a few there's a few things that this man says that are ju just I mean it's a lot of things he says that's just crazy and these Christians just don't they just don't know the Bible they don't know what they're talking about um we've we've shown that we've demonstrated that for years I mean everybody who's a Hebrew Israelite nine times out of ten your introduction to all this is that the Christians don't know the Bible and you learn that damn this whole my whole life I've spent in Christianity, I don't know the Bible. Um, and then you start to learn it through Hebrew Israel, what they call Hebrew Israelism, and now the Bible actually makes sense, and you know, you understand it now. Um, so we're gonna do what Hebrew Israelites, through the grace of the most high and the spirit and power of the most high, always do, which is show Christians who the actual scholars and people who God is dealing with and giving the understanding of the Bible to. Right. Oh, uh, you've seen the the uh if you haven't seen this video, Officer Asai Karab dealing with this same man, Eric Mason, right here on this channel. Woke church runs from Hebrew Israelites. All right, let's go to some other videos that we've done in regards to the woke church. Um and Pastor Eric Mason in particular. Pastor sweating. Okay. <laughs> just just sweating up a storm. Uh, <laughs> Sergeant Yatai recently did. Where is your video? Right here. Pastor sweating, losing congregations to Israelites. Here's why. Uh, Sergeant Yatai up here did a marvelous job with this as well as this, which Israelites are messing up the church's money. Okay. In addition to the video we showed. And um, where's that other one we did? The commentary to his response, which is where? Right here, Pastor Eric Mason's robs congregation, and this one, Israelites refute Pastor Eric Mason in the woke church. Woke church runs from Israelites. So one, two, three, his one. So about six videos. This would be the seventh video um, where we deal with him in particular. Uh, and, and this is the video. It's called, again, Engage in Hebrew Israelites. And we're going to get, we're going to deal with this, man, through the spirit, man. So sit back, relax, um, and enjoy. Ain't it crazy that He's got this thing doing engaging Hebrew Israelites, and this is what those people in the NFL were calling uh, 
no swag to come up there and do. Teach them how to engage with Hebrew Israelites. That's the topic now. It's crazy. Exactly. And and this is because we're becoming so much of a problem. Right. Um, he says something. We're not going to go to this point, but he says something. And he says, when you know we're dangerous is when we have gotten to the middle class. Right. Do you hear when he said that? Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. Well, you don't know. We're past the middle class. It's Way multi-millionaires past. that are in this truth. Right. It's crazy because this man, and I, I, I'll talk about it because I'm going to talk about this. He says that the brothers in Demona that went back to Israel living in hefty poverty, he must not know how many celebrities have gave millions to that community. He has right. no, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. It's crazy, man. You know, it's, it's not just broke people who are looking for hope who believe in this. And that's what he's trying to paint uh, like us or the nation of Islam. Like we're just some cult that appeals to poor people. Yeah. People out of jail. <laughs> yeah. People forget. Yeah. yeah well, in the jails, like, <laughs> nah, like, all walks of life are understanding that the Bible is saying what we're saying. And that's why people are leaving his church. Period. A- including soldier Ariel that's in, in our camp. Exactly. Di- walk directly out of that church and put on a Sakari shirt. That's right. right. That's right. By right. the spirit of power of Yahweh, by Shem Yahweh Shine. You can try to act like it's not a big deal to you, but it is. Right. That's why he lied on him and said that he kicked him out the church when in reality he left. <laughs> you know, but that, right. that's what you call a, a, a what they call it, um, you know, cleanup control, damage control. Right. Right. So, yeah, let's let's get into it. We're going to start right here. Timestamp is three minutes. And uh, we're going to start at six seconds. So let's pay attention here. With the goal of leading people from spiritual death to spiritual life, say leading people from spiritual death to spiritual life not win the argument because there are times when you will look like you lose the argument <laughs> that was the best part to me that's the only reason i let it play it's telling me you're gonna look like you lose y'all look like you lose all the time who is that um uh, Marissa Younger, yeah, how about show me y'all shot broken thought about the water sister for the uh super chat make sure y'all like sub sharing super chat um it's funny that he says that because he knows that they always look like they lose, including right. him to somebody who's less than more than uh, less than half his age, which right. is Officer Azad in Dallas, Texas. But the point I want to harp on is spiritual death to spiritual life. So because uh, these Christians, they throw these terms around Man. without qualifying. Right. So mm-hmm. what is spiritual death? That's the question. Right. Go ahead. Uh, get, let me know when you got it. Uh, Hassad. This is Proverbs chapter 21 <clears throat> and verse 16. Read. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding. The man who leave understanding, read. Shall remain in the congregation of the dead. So that's spiritual death. But the question is, you have to wander out of the way of understanding. So what is understanding? Right? So let me know when you got that. This is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. Uh huh. It says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, uh-huh. even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Boom. So the understanding is the law. So the wonder out of the commandments of God is spiritual death. So you use this term. When your whole ideology is to stay away from the law, you're not realizing that that term means to stop, meaning to go from being a sinner and breaking the laws into not doing it anymore, to not breaking the laws, to not sinning, to keeping them. So that terminology that you're using is contradictory to your whole ideology. (laughs) That's the cold part about it, right? So let's see what spiritual life is to even further hammer the point in Proverbs 7 and 2. This is Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 2. Uh, verse, uh, verse 2? Uh-huh. This is, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. You and Romans already yeah, here. That's next. Yeah, Proverbs so 7 and 2. Proverbs chapter 7 verse 2. It says, keep my commandments and live. Mm. So life is keep the commandments, <laughs> right? Go ahead. And my law as the apple of thine eye. See that? So let's go to uh, Romans 7 and 14. So we say, know that keeping the law is life. Wandering out of the way of understanding is death. The law is your understanding. Keeping the law is 
life. And what else is the law? Romans 7 and 14. Romans 7 and 14. Uh -huh. so we know that the law is spiritual. So keeping the law is life and the law is spiritual. Then spiritual life is keeping the law and spiritual death is breaking the law. <laughs> it's literally that simple. But a Christian will throw these words around. And when you hear about spiritual life and death, it sounds mystical and spooky. But it's actually very simple. So if he could throw them around without any qualification and it just mean whatever people want to take from it, then you can try to push your narrative that you ain't have to keep the laws. But if you look biblically to how the Bible speaks to both those terms, it's clear one is breaking the laws. The other is keeping them. Right. It's not rocket science. So already we're not four minutes into this video and he's already blundering like this. It's, it's really kind of crazy. Uh, what you got? This is uh, Deuteronomy 32, 46 to 47. And he said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. No. See that? Boom. I mean, how are you going to get out of that? <laughs> That's what I'd like to know. Oh, because we don't have to do that anymore. All we got to do now is keep the laws of Christ. <laughs> I listen, and I can't wait till we get to the law of Christ. That's going to be the, that's going to be my favorite part of this whole thing. It's unbelievable. I don't think he realizes that he's waking up every single day fighting against God. It's crazy, man. <laughs> and that's a that's that's a dangerous fight to be in. Imagine that waking up every day fighting with God. My God, telling people going as deep as you can into all these breakdowns. Just so you can tell people not to keep the laws, <laughs> but keep the keep the commandments of Christ. But don't <laughs> it's, it's crazy, man. It, it's ludicrous. Uh, where we at? What now? Watch this, right? Let's go here. Uh, uh, at ten minutes, watch this. And what is my purpose? And I would say, and we'll see. The gospel answers all of those questions for all people equally, their spiritual identity and their natural identity. Let me say that again. The Bible, the Bible affirms your dignity in both um, your new identity and your human identity. So he's saying here that the Bible affirms the identity or, or the dignity in every identity. <laughs> dignity, right? Dignity. So let's see if, if all people are dignified through the Bible. Uh, Leviticus 25 and 44. Let's go here. Let's see if everybody is dignified. I want to pull this up. Uh -huh. It's Leviticus 25 and 44. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids. So it said a bondman, meaning that you're slaves. Let, let's look at this in another translation, right? So you're female slaves and you're male slaves. Male and female slaves. Male and female slave, 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 slave. Y'all see a slave. Slave, 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 right? You're slaves. Read. Which thou shalt have uh -huh. shall be of the heathen. The heathen are the Gentiles, the non-Israelites. <laughs> you can have slaves of the heathen. Is that dignity? Go, <laughs> go ahead. Is it dignifying to be a slave? Go ahead. It says, which thou shalt have shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. By human beings. Is that dignifying in the Bible? Now read 39. Verse 39. It says, and if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor. If your brother now, read. And be sold unto thee, uh -huh. thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant. So it says, if an Israelite is sold to you he can't be a slave he's not to be a slave but the other people they can be slaves so that is direct contradictory to the statement the brother just made because it's not affirming people's dignity it's telling you an israelite cannot be a slave but everyone else can be slaves that's not a that, that's showing you that somebody is above somebody else Period. somebody has more dignity than another person and and it's by ethnicity it's inherent through uh, the nation of people. So it's not even based upon the actions of any in particular person, but just through your inherent nation nature of being a certain nation, it lets you know whether you're dignified or not in the Torah, in the eyes of God, under his governmental structure. So what in the hell is Eric Mason talking about? Get out of Leviticus 19 and 20. But let's show a further, let's show, let's further show everyone's dignity. Everyone is not given dignity with the Bible. Israelites are, but certainly not anybody else, right? So Leviticus 19 and 20. Leviticus 19 and 20. And whoso lieth carnally with a woman, that is a bondman. That is a what? Bondman. What does that mean? A slave. 
anybody who lies carnally with a slave girl, right? Well, let's hold on. Let's if, if I'm making this up, let's look at another translation. Watch this in KJV, see concubine, which we know this is it means a slave girl, but there's another one that literally said, Yeah, if a man has sex with a slave girl, slave girl, right? Go ahead. And whosoever lies carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid, uh -huh. betrothed to an husband. And not at all redeemed, mm -hmm. nor freedom given her, uh -huh. she shall be scourged. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. Because she was not free, they shall not be put to death. Now, watch this Deuteronomy. Oh, who is that? Uh, D Brown, Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Baraka Thawath the water for that. Um, give me um, Deuteronomy 22 and 23 to 24 now. So we read here if you, if you have sex with a woman who's a slave girl, but she is betrothed, which means promised or engaged to somebody. You don't get put to death for it, right? Now watch this. Deuteronomy 22. Or, yeah, 22. Go ahead. Deuteronomy 22 and 23. Uh -huh. If a damsel that is a virgin, she would trot unto an husband, uh -huh. and a man finds her in the city and lie with her, uh -huh. then he shall bring them both out into the gate of that city. Uh -huh. And he shall stone them with stones. Read on. That they die. Uh -huh. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he has humbled his neighbor's wife. So we see here with an Israelite woman, if she's promised to somebody, and you have sex with her. This is before they married now. Her just being promised to somebody. If you have sex with an Israelite woman and she's promised to an Israelite man, you get put to death like you committed adultery, right? Even though she hasn't technically married this man yet. But if she's a slave girl, which are only non-Israelites as we already pre-qualified in Deuteronomy, I mean in Leviticus 25, then you don't get put to death. What is this showing you? It's showing you a status that somebody is less dignified than somebody else. That the Israelite woman is so dignified and the Israelite man is so dignified that you can't do that to them. You can't have sex with this woman even if she's promised to me, right? But if a heathen woman who's in slavery is promised to somebody and you have sex with her, I mean, hey, bro, it's not that big a deal. She's going to be scourged and nothing's really going to happen to you other than you're going to have to uh, maybe pay a, a restitution to the person who owns her. But not death, like it would be if it was an Israelite. So this is clearly showing you you have a caste system, a class system, you have a societal hierarchy that is being affirmed in Torah, which is the law of God. See that? So no, everyone does not get dignity in the Bible. That's retarded. All right. And let's show you now that your good old New Testament, the so-called New Testament. Right. We believe in these books, but it's not even the New Testament. That's something that Eusebius came up with centuries after its compilation to even call these the New Testament. These writings affirm the same thing. Galatians, we're going to start four and twenty two and we're going to read the twenty six. Let's see if this same ideology is present here by your beloved apostle Paul, our beloved brother from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul, read on Galatians four and twenty two. Uh -huh. For it is written with that slogan that Abraham had two sons. The one by bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Uh -huh, sure. wait, wait, wait. He had two sons, one by a bondmaid and one by a free woman. Right. So we have a slave and a woman who's not a slave. Go ahead. Uh, it says, but he who was of the bond woman uh -huh. was born after the flesh. Oh, so the slave, the one from the slave girl was born after the flesh. Go ahead. But the other by a slave, but, the, but he of the free woman was by promise. Uh huh. Verse 24. Which things are an allegory. Uh -huh. For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai was gendered to bondage, uh -huh. which is Hagar. Right, which gendered to bondage, showing you that it's saying that the Ishmaelites' ultimate uh, destiny is still bondage. <laughs> this is Paul reaffirming this. Keep going. It says, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai uh -huh. in Arabia. And answer it to Jerusalem. And what? Answer it to Jerusalem. It answers to Jerusalem. That means it's subjugated and in slavery to Jerusalem. That's so this, go ahead. I. No, so that's what that means. <laughs> An answer of two meaning I got to take my orders from you. <laughs> where's the dignity of Hagar in the Ishmaelites? In the New Testament, where is this at? Right? Go, uh, uh, Mary B. Yahweh Shem Yahweh Shah Barakat Tawath Water says for a very generous donation. Go ahead. Um, it says was gendered to bondage with it is now it's like my fault in answer to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children and is in bondage in slavery there's no dignity here for people who aren't Israelites keep going verse 26 but Jerusalem which is above 
is free, uh -huh. which is the mother of us all. So here we see Jerusalem is free, but Sinai is in slavery to Jerusalem and answers to it. Right? So we clearly see here the okay. dignity being emphasized of Israel and none else. Right? Clear in the Bible. Let's keep going now. <laughs> Next point. <laughs> you top just like the situation with um Passover. Right. You already like it, it's 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 racism right there. <laughs> it's clear. Right. You can have a slave right. from these people, but you can't have a slave from these people. Plain and simple. <laughs> For real. It's there. Racism, <laughs> dignity of one people over another, superiority, preferential treatment, ethnic hierarchy is all right there, plain black and white in the text. You get a point out? Yeah. Yeah, and in order for them to keep their uh, their doctrine going, they have to just ignore scriptures like that, and act like they're not there. You know, just completely ignore it, and act like everything God said is just not true. Salvation is for everybody. The promises are for everybody. Just ignore everything that we just read. It's crazy, man. There's no ethnic hierarchy. So it don't make no sense. They, they love saying that, but it's clear. <laughs> it's clear. It, it, it's hilarious because even if you go back to um. When polite debated that rabbi Harry Rosenberg, man, it was hilarious because Harry <laughs> Rosenberg is sitting there going, "No, nah, man, it's all good, and you know everyone could be an Israelite." And he's going, "Wait a minute, what?" So, so these these brothers that's on the corner, they're just making this up, right? <laughs> then he's going into the scriptures like, "No, it's clearly a, a ethnic hierarchy here. Clearly, clearly, somebody is better than somebody else. We're, we didn't just make this up." Like, but like we just wrote these words down today. Like these words haven't been sitting here this whole time. I'm trying to figure out in seminary school how were they able to get this past uh, Dr. Eric Mason and Noswek? How were they able to teach around all these all these words we're reading and make this doctrine in front of your guys' face like that? It's just crazy, man. <laughs> I don't understand it. No, no, it, it, it's ludicrous. And on top of how ludicrous it is, man. Um, what I was gonna say, uh, uh. There was a point I was going to make on this. Uh, oh, like a lot of us, we we were Christians. Right. So it's not like we had this preconceived superiority thing in our minds and we just wanted to find it in the Bible. Like, at all. Open the Bible and realize it was there. Period. <laughs> we never, you know how hard it is for certain people, Deacon Hakan in the camp. Yatab can give you the testimony of when he was trying to tell him he was an Israelite and he was better than somebody, and he fought him tooth and nail on it because of his Christian upbringing. Right, right or wrong? Right. And we all did that. I remember the first time I seen the Malcolm X movie, and he was breaking down how Jesus was black, and I'm like, it doesn't say that he had hair or wool. It says that his hair was white, light wool. Like, I was really running around arguing with people about that. When they showed us the white picture of Jesus, we were just fine with that. Fine. Oh, I'm a Gentile. We were fine with that. We weren't running around tripping. Hey, we hey, Jesus died for everybody. That's it. It just so happened that when we opened up the Bible and started reading, we seen that that was a lie. And we seen that that white boy picture, there's no way they can come up with that from the uh after you read the descriptions of Christ. No way you should get that picture. It, look, even even close, real quick. I want to give a big shout out and shalom to the brother. Um Divine just came through in the um in the chat. Yeah, we're gonna heat him up. We're gonna heat him up real yeah. quick in the spirit, brother. I'm getting him. You know, uh, where we at? Um, okay, so watch this next one. Watch what he say here, y'all. This is this is one of my favorite parts of the whole lecture. <laughs> watch this. Him and that God has showed him that we are the actual ancient Israelites. I, I think most of us would thinking we the ancient Israelites on the hell we was going through a slavery, right? Wait, so so he just said it. We should think we're the Israelites because of wow. all the hell that we went through. He's saying it. Wow. And it's funny, doesn't the scripture say that the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God? Boom. Right there. <laughs> that, that's great. I was happy when he said that. I said, thank you. You're proving our point. And so when you're Once again. Reality, you'd be like, man, Exodus sure sounds familiar. Exodus sure sounds familiar. Is that a coincidence that Exodus sounds familiar? And we're just crazy <laughs> because okay. we feel the same way. <laughs> Watch this. Watch this. You know what's funny? Go ahead. These white Jewish people don't feel the same way. They don't read Exodus and say, hey, that kind of feels like, like what happened over here. They don't have that, that same connection. <laughs> you know, exactly. They they don't. Now watch this. This is um real quick, y'all. This is Eddie S. Glaude, right? He's a distant cousin of mine. We're related. So this dude, he is a uh, I want to just read some of his uh who he is real quick. He's the chair of, of the Center of African-American Studies 
at the William S. Todd Professor of Religion at African American Studies at Princeton University. Right. So he's one of the foremost people in this country in study of being African American history and religion. Right. right. Uh, he's a 1989 graduate of Morehouse College, where he was student government president. He holds a master's degree in African American studies from Temple University and a master religion degree from Princeton. Princeton. This is Ivy League now. Glaude earned his Ph.D. in religion from Princeton and is a founding member of the senior fellow of the Jamestown Project. So here we see he's a doctor. Right. Got it from an Ivy League school. Black man. Right. And his first book is called Exodus, Religion, Race and Nation in the Early 19th Century in Black America. Right. Mm -hmm. so this book. Right. Is a very important. I, I have the book, but I want to just show it to you all real quick. Um, and I suggest people get it because it's good, because he shows all of the immense parallels between the African-American experience and <laughs> the Exodus. Uh, it says no other story in the Bible has fired the imagination of African-Americans quite like that of Exodus. It's a tale of suffering and the journey to redemption offered hope and a sense of possibility to people facing seemingly insurmountable evil. Exodus shows how this biblical story inspired a pragmatic tradition of racial advocacy among African-Americans in the early 19th century, a tradition based not on race, but of moral politics and respectability. Eddie S. Glaude begins by comparing the historical issues of Exodus by black and white Americans and the concept of nation it generated, right? So he literally is just comparing and contrasting our experience since slavery in America and the Exodus, clearly showing it. Boom, boom, boom. He has a whole book on it. It's a, sold, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies. So I suggest people get it. But these just work together to show it's not it can't just be a coincidence that out of everybody on the earth, we're the only people who can relate to the story in the Bible. Right. Nobody else can deal with it. Nobody else could really say that it speaks to their experience, their history, what their people have gone through. Nobody. Especially not the, the people who are per, uh, pretending to perpetrate the fraud to be the Jews. That's Maybe. the interesting part about it. Go ahead. Ike. And it's crazy because they're acting like we're not even supposed to be looking in the earth to see if these curses or if these signs are on anybody, they're acting like all oh, that's just over with all these things that the Lord said was going to happen that he said, we'll be following the Israelites. That it's just done now. So there's no reason for us to even be looking for it. They just on every front. They're trying to make God a liar, man. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's really, it's really crazy. And, and he does it. He may, he tries to make God a liar a couple times in this, and we're going to go over those times as well. Now watch this real quick. This was appalling. into, uh, in the 60s, uh, moving many of them to Israel and have been having a hard time getting nationalized as Israelites because they're not, they haven't converted. They just believe that their bloodline is Israel. And because of that, lack of conversion and a lack of. A Again, that's a lie. The reason why they're having a hard time getting citizenship or they did, they don't have it anymore, but they did have a hard time getting citizenship. It's simply because they're black and Israel is known as one of the more overtly racist countries in the world. That's why they're trying to kick out all the African immigrants out of there right now. They just hate black people over there. It has nothing to do with conversion because for all intents and purposes, those brothers follow closely to Judaism um, that are over there. It's not like they're super anti-Orthodox Jew. In a lot of ways, they follow Judaism. They speak the Hebrew that the Jewish man speak, etc. So that wasn't really the case. The case was simply because of their skin color. That's it, right? They need to the DNA evidence that they actual Israelites, they've had. Hard they were over there before DNA evidence that anybody was an Israelite even existed, and that science was even advanced at that point. We're talking about in the early, I mean, the late sixties, early seventies. So that was even prior to that science being paramount like it is now. So no, that's not the reason. You're ignorant. You're speaking out of total ignorance. I think recently the nation has affirmed them, but they're living in hefty poverty. Not recently. They've been affirmed them, and they're not living in hefty poverty. Like I spoke to earlier. Um, if I start naming celebrities, you know, um, Whitney Houston, uh, uh, and, and I, that's one of them. I'll name Whitney. All right. Uh, who, you know, who's, who's, who's passed on Whitney amongst several other prominent black celebrities from America got on the plane, went over to Israel and gave them people millions. They're not allowed to work more than 20 hours a week over there. Not because there's not work, but they're not allowed to because they are to spend less time working and more time relaxing and focusing on the most high. They're required to get at least one massage a month over there. People don't know that. What? 
I, I can mention a lot of names. I know a lot of names, but I ain't going to mention all the names that went over there and dropped M's off. But trust me, they're not living in hefty poverty over there. They have their own school system over there that's so good that the white man sent his kids to their school. Right? But you don't know that. You, so you're speaking out of total ignorance, bro. Right. So uh, let me continue. All right. Let's go here. This is, this is when it starts getting real good and doctrinal. So let's go here. As belligerent as many of the camps do. Many Americans are original Hebrew Israelites. The law as central to salvation and justification and covenant connection. So what do I mean by that? Uh, and we'll break that down in a minute. But the law is central in relation to uh, to salvation. Whether they even if they believe in justification by faith, they which we do believe in justification by faith, right? But go ahead. Believe that you're covenantly kept by your commitment to the law. So, so he's saying that we believe that we are covenantly kept by the commitment to the law, which we of course do believe. Read. I still like it. Read. I need to press play. My fault. Okay. Um, most believe only salvation. Uh, only in the, the salvation of Israel. Okay, so he says that most of us believe that the law is central to salvation and salvation is exclusive for Israel. So I want to address those two points. You had a point, Yatal, go ahead. No, I'm just laughing at this idiot, man. He, it, it, it's crazy. It's This whole thing is crazy, right? But let's go to uh, Matthew 5 and 19. Let's go here first because let's deal with the first claim. But not the first claim. It's true. We do believe that the law is central to salvation, right? We believe that we get justification through Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, who he calls Christ, right? right? But what did Christ tell us? 5 and 19. Matthew 5 and 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, mm -hmm. and, shall yeah. be, and so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So Christ is how we get to the kingdom of heaven. We're supposed to listen to what he tells us to do, right? He says that if we break the least, we'll be the least. So what does that let us know? To not break the commandments, period. Yeah. <laughs> it's right there. Go ahead. Um, Let's finish nineteen. But whosoever shall do and, uh, but whosoever shall do and teach them. So not only just do the commandments, but also teach people to also do them. Right? Read. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There we go. And that's what we're trying to achieve, right? Greatness, reigning with Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, etc. We can't do that if we're not keeping the law and teaching people to keep it. That's what he said. Right. Have you guys ever noticed that whenever he breaks down Matthew 5 and 17, he never goes to 5 and 18? Yeah, or he just stays in 17. See, fulfill. And then he does all that. <laughs> he just does a filibuster on the word fulfill. Right. Now 18 and 19 and right. 20. And you can even go down 21, 22. He leaves all that out and just right. filibusters on what fulfill means. And we, I can't wait till we get to that point because right. this young brother aside schooled him and what that meant. And now he's teaching it like he'd been teaching that when he was saying something else when he came in front of the brother. And we're going to show the receipts on that. Right. Right. So let's get uh, Matthew 19 and 17 now. Read. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. Mm -hmm. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? Uh -huh. There is none good but one. There is none good but one. Read on. That is God. Uh huh. But if thou wilt enter into life, Keep the commandments. If you're going to get saved, that's enter into life. Keep the commandments. This is what he said. So I know I'm supposed to believe on him, right? Faith in him, etc. And he said to do this. So I'm going to do that. Right. Hey, he said that's talking about the command, the, the, the laws of Christ. You also that's what talking about, you know, he, he changed up everything, which is unbelievably inconsistent. But they talk about consistency. It's crazy, man. Right? Very inconsistent. And, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I can't wait to get to that point. The law of until we bust that that uh false that fallacy open, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so let's so we have two witnesses of Hamashiach Yahweh whom they call Jesus Christ, who is a so-called black man for the record. Two instances, right, where he affirms to keep we have to keep the law to get saved, that law, that the law is central to salvation, right? So let's go and see if anyone else in the New Testament does this, even though the two Examples of the Messiah doing it should be good enough. Let's go to their beloved Apostle Paul, our beloved brother, right? Romans 3 and 31. Okay, this is Romans. And this is elementary school for Hebrew Israelites, a lot of these verses. We all know them off top. That's why the Christians are getting tore up so much. And he even had to do this damn lecture is because the scriptures that we need to counter their arguments are all elementary school for us. We learn within the first 30 to 90 days in this truth. All right? right. So read Romans 3 and 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Uh -huh. 
God forbid. We know we have justification through faith. But do we void the law through faith? God forbid. Read on. Yeah, we establish the law. We do what? Establish We the establish law. it. We're teaching people it, and we are keeping it. Now let's go to the last book of the Bible, to John the Revelator. Let's see what he says, uh, Revelations 14 and 12. Let's see if he agrees that the law is central to salvation. So we got Yahweh Shah, we have Paul. Let's go to our third witness. Revelation 14 and 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God uh -huh. and the faith of Yahweh Shah. See that? The saints who are patiently waiting for salvation are those who have faith in Hamashiach Yahweh Shah and keep the commandments of God. All right. So that, that even takes the law of Christ thing out. Because it's talking about the commandments of God, which deal with the Mosaic law, right? Even though the law of Christ is also the same thing, but just for the sake of their retarded argument, let's entertain it. It say the law of God, right? What's the law of God? To love God and love neighbor. <laughs> you hear what he said that? Love God, love neighbor. That's <laughs> if there isn't instructions on how to do it, which is called the 613 law of the commandments. Right. That's the instructions on how to. Because if, if you just say to love God and love neighbor, but nobody defines what and how love is everybody right. can just personally go off of their feelings on what loving somebody is right how many times have uh, uh if you see an abusive relationship and somebody's abusing the hell out of their significant other but they telling them they love them and then somebody right. comes and goes that's not love right it, the, <laughs> this nigga saying he loves them he thinks right. that he loves this person you have women that that grow up in abusive they're little girls and they see an abusive relationship and then they grow up to be in a, an abusive relationship and they feel like if a nigga ain't beating their ass he don't love them right he thinks that that's love and then you you don't you don't suffer from that so you look at that now how can she think that's love that's not love right. but that shows you that somebody's got to step in and tell us what love is in order for us to know we can't just make it up according to how we feel or how society views it there has to be some type of guidelines as to what love is and that is identified in the law. That's clearly spoke about in the Bible, the New Testament. The whole law hangs on these two things because each law is elaborating or building upon the building block that is love God and neighbor. Right. Then it's who is neighbor. <laughs> That's the next thing. Who is neighbor? Who is neighbor? <laughs> For real. That stuff is crazy, man. Um, <laughs> where, where are we at? So like, OK, so Israel only salvation being exclusive to Israel, Matthew 1 and 21. So we have, again, three witnesses to prove law is central to salvation. Yahweh Shah Mashiach, the Apostle Paul, and the John the Revelator. Let's now go into the Gospels and see if salvation is exclusive to the nation of ethnic Israel. Right, Read Matthew 1 and 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahweh Shah, uh -huh. for he shall save his people from their sins. His people from their sins. There is Israel exclusive salvation. Now, Luke 1. 67 to 74 again this is elementary school to a hebrew israelite and this totally cripples christian doctrine luke chapter 1 verse 68 blessed be the lord god of israel for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us his people for us read in the house of his servant david uh-huh as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets read on which have been since the world began uh-huh that we should be saved from our enemies. We should be saved from our enemies. So our enemies cannot get a joint salvation with us if we are being saved from them. Right. Makes no sense, right? Go ahead. And from the hand of all that hate us. Uh -huh. All that hate us. People that hate the Israelites, that the Israelites have to be saved from. Period. <laughs> and that's what Christ came to do. Not whatever y'all are painting him to be. Right? So go ahead. That's in on uh, 71. 74. 74. So uh -huh. like, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. Okay. Did all the fathers of the earth get a mercy promised to them? Nope. No. Right? Read. Uh, and to remember his holy covenant. Uh huh. His holy covenant. Who did he make a holy covenant with? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Right? Read. The oath which he swore to our father. To who? Our father. Who? Abraham. Is every everyone. Abraham. Abraham. Right? Read on. Uh, verse 74. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. So here we have two witnesses in the gospel to demonstrate through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai, Israel exclusive salvation. So you're acting like what we're saying is ludicrous, but we're clearly getting this directly out of plain black and white Bible verses, right? 
but all that's consistent with what we read in the Old Testament. The Lord made the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in their seed. Luke and the Israelites are the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But all of a sudden, in the Christian doctrine, everything gets inconsistent where now everybody is involved. So that means that God was literally lying to Abraham when he told him, no, I'm not going to make a covenant with your son Ishmael. I'm going to bless him, but I'm going to make the covenant with Isaac. But all of a sudden today, Ishmael is a part of the covenant. So God was just lying to Abraham. Exactly. Ishmael and Esau now. Right. Hypothetically, whoever, we, let's not even talk about who they are, whoever the hell they are, they can enter into covenant when they all were rejected. <laughs> just making God a liar. That's what they're trying to do. This, uh, and kind of nerd across my inconsistent, man. It's crazy, man. Uh, Zakaria Swift Israel, Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shah Baraka Thaw Wat the Wadar. Now, watch this. Watch this. Kingdom, I'm going to say, I said Isaiah 14, first, I'm going to talk about it. That's on their hermeneutics. Isaiah 28 is how they talk about and work through um, the idea of slavery among uh, uh, um, 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 whites and others. So he has a problem with us saying white people are going into slavery. That's interesting. Uh, let's go to Revelations 13 and 10. This is red letter now. This is Christ speaking in the book of Revelations, right? To John the Revelator. Let's see what he says in 13 and 10. Revelation 13 and 10. Uh -huh. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So wait a minute. You know, you admit you speak on the fact that black people have been taken into chattel slavery by white people. You know that, Eric. You talk about it. You try to make that a conversation amongst Christians, right? Well, Christ said, if you lead people into captivity, you're going to go into it. No, what they're going to do is they're going to go to the ESV version and dance out of that. Oh, oh, yeah, they got some madness in the ESV, huh? Right. They switch it up. <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that's that, all I'm going to say about that is that's incredible. But they don't switch up Exodus 21 and 16. See, which is he that uh, selleth the man, still the man that selleth him, or if he's found in his hand, he, he shall surely be put to death. Yeah. We got to deal with that. See, y'all are crazy. Y'all y'all people are really crazy. And you have to understand something, Eric Mason. The reason why your white colleagues that translated those later translations of the Bible, those more modern ones that you prefer and you love so much and they love so much and they have translated it the way they do is because they understand that there are things in that Bible that point to judgment that comes upon them. So they change it the same way they got the Deuteronomy 28 and 68 all jacked up the way they do. <laughs> it, it's because it happened. The translation came centuries after all these atrocities happened. And it's so obvious. And the way that they'd have to translate it in these modern translation would make it even more obvious to the point where they just had to hide it and mask it. Right. It's a clear conspiracy, brother. Right. Uh, where we at? Boom. That was really th finish 13 and 10. Uh, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Mm -hmm. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Right. So now let's go to the next point. Oh, 25. So that, that's your tribe. Check it, check out, find out where your tribe is. But all those aside, they use Genesis 48. It's 49. Why? Very stereotypical, under very racist, stereotypical understanding of different groups and localizes them to these groups of people. He, he says it's, our, we take Genesis 49, he said 48, 49, and, and it's racist, right? What we do is racist. So let's read, so I get 49 and 8. Let's see if this is racist. Genesis 49 and 8. Uh -huh. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Uh -huh. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. We say this is in reference to that the fact that the African American is the most influential group of people in the world, right? This is what we say. Well, Bible translations are conspiracy theories. If you knew the Hebrew and Greek, you would know the Rome 26 and 13, 10 are correct now, not before. Uh, Vocab Malone, uh, you're not the only person that studies Hebrew and Greek. Devil. Okay. And I, and I understand that there is a general consensus that's been came to by a bunch of white people who are the perpetrators of these crimes. And uh, you feel like that's correct. I understand that. Uh, I reasonably, and according to Eric Mason, I reasonably call that into question. And we have our own scholars, including ourselves, that take a look at these things and do comparative linguistics and studies and come to other conclusions, brother. I mean, uh, vocab. All right. 
So so let's not act like, oh, it's correct now. It's correct now. Why? Because a bunch of damn devils say it. I want you to explain to me how that's how I would look at that as sensible. It's ridiculous. Anyway, back to the point. Is it so it's racist to say that African Americans are trendsetters? And yeah. everyone looks to them for the newest trends and, and as an, an example to follow in pop culture. That's racist. It, the Yankee hat is the most popular hat in the world because brothers in New York wore it. <laughs> I mean, why else is he? Let me ask you, the average nigga walking around with a Yankee hat, your top. Do you think he knows uh, who the starting lineup, the starting Absolutely lineup for the New York not. Yankees is? Absolutely not. There's no way, <laughs> right? But everywhere you go, starting from New York City and now all over the world, the Chinese man in Japan, they're all wearing a Yankee hat, right? Right. So we're saying that it, it's it's a fact. There's not that's not racist, right? Let's keep going. Verse thirteen, right? Zebulon shall dwell at a haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be desired on. So we're saying that this is in reference to the Panama Canal and the various ports that exist throughout Meso or Central America, right? This is a fact that th this is one of the most major ports and stretch of ports in the world, right? That's racist to say that. That, that, that's slander, what you're doing when you say it's racist, right? 14, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. We said this is in reference to Mexicans being hard workers. Are you saying it's racist to say Mexicans are hard workers? Or is it a fact that they are so much of the workforce that white people are creating and attempting to create predatory anti-immigration laws in order to combat the fact that they're saying that they're flooding the workforce? These are facts. It's not racist to say that a Mexican is a hard worker. Right? Uh, so like it. Let's go to 19. Watch this 19. Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome him at the last, right? So uh, were the Native American Indians overtaken by the U.S. Cavalry? Did that happen? Yes, it did. Are we saying that in the last days, through the leadership of the King Hamashiach, Yahweh whom you call Christ, they will rise up and overcome against those that overcame against them? What's racist about that? So that that was mudslinging at its worst. Why don't, why don't they break it down? Why don't they sit here and tell us what we're what we're saying is wrong? Why don't you tell us what it means, uh, skinny jean pastor? Like I always say, if you have a problem with our breakdown of anything, give us a viable antithesis. Right, an anti-thesis, a thesis that is anti-the thesis that we present it, right? Something that's viable, something that makes sense. I've yet to see anyone ever do that for the identity of the 12 tribes, whether they say it had already happened or it's talking about different groups of people that we conclude it's talking about. No one's ever done that, which only reaffirms the faith that we already have, that we have the proper understanding about it through the spirit. Period. Because they never can do it. Oh, it's racist. What's racist? <laughs> And every time that they say we're racist about the 12 tribes, the only thing they go to is Mexicans. But are, are we literally going to sit there and say Mexicans are not hard workers? You can't won't even think to open your mouth to say that. You, you know they're hard workers. You know that they'll do a job and, and get a job done in a way for, a, for a, a rate of pay that nobody else will. You know that. I'll get it done fast, too, and efficient, man. Come get that... Uh, 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 you know that there's nothing racist about acknowledging that Mexicans are hard workers. And that's the only thing that they can say. So so he'll they'll take that and say it's a racial stereotype. And then they'll say, yeah, it's, their, their breakdown is based on racial stereotypes. No, 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 no. It's a, that's a fact. And that's the only one that you could even say is a racial stereotype. Unless you want to say Haitians and voodoo is a racial stereotype. And you can say that if you want, but I'll get every Haitian, myself included, the man sitting next to me included, and every other Haitian, and you ask them if voodoo is not a problem and something that is commonly of practice amongst Haitian people, and they'll tell you yes. So it's not just a racial stereotype. We do voodoo. <laughs> it's true. It, it, it's what we do. You know what I'm saying? We're either Catholic or voodoo, and some of us do a little of both. Um, uh, uh. I don't know why I'm having such a problem with this. Yashama Allah Yahweh, Yahweh Shem Yashar Barakatah Wathwada again, and Mayaka Allah Havier. 
uh, John Vier, rather, John Vier, Yahweh Bashim Yahshua Barakatha Wata Wata again. This is something I've learned concerning spiritual matters, man. You never trust a man in a die shiki and skinny jeans. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> It was ridiculous, man. And, but then you see these new balances he got on? I got on the new balances. I used from Nettie's. The guys. <laughs> he got on the new balance. How does that, how does that, how does this outfit even flowing together? Man, I know his wife is tired of seeing him leave out the house dressed. With the jeans. Him. Remember he had the jeans, the jeans rolled up like Tom Sawyer one day. Now he just put on <laughs> like some, some skinny jeans and a and a five X daishiki. Dude is crazy. Man. <laughs> He's a clown. A lot of nerve, man. Let's just call it what it is. He's a clown. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Walking out the house like that. <laughs> Dude is crazy, man. See, but, but that's what's wrong when you're in a damn vanilla Christian church and, and right. your life is just boring and bland. You can do things like wear those jeans with those new balances with that dashiki. You can do that. <laughs> the dude has to jump up in the air when he's pulling the pants up. It got the well, this guy really went to the store and looked at those pants and said, Man, these will look great on me. Man. You, you top, you top. You remember when Drake said, Took a half an hour just to get, get that belt to fasten. Yeah, <laughs> 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 got a lot of nerve, man. Oh, man. And he gonna get on stage and talk about us and talk say we're grimy us. in reference to our dress. How <laughs> dare you, man? Yeah. man? Just look at that whole ensemble, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, man, it's just crazy, man. Look, they're crying in the chat. Y'all know he wrong. Y'all know he dead wrong. Where the sisters at? Sisters, you better talk to this man's wife and she knows. She better tell this brother, man. This yeah. is wrong. <laughs> it definitely don't look like he was getting dressed to go hold a microphone anywhere, man. <laughs> like, man, maybe sit down and just chill out in the back. But, man, you want all cameras on you like that? <laughs> Multiple angles. I all gotta... eyes on him. <laughs> I got a, I got an African daishiki. Man, this dude is corny, man. Right, but 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 never talks about now because the whole thing is he when he talked about earlier. If y'all if y'all watch it, which anybody y'all can go watch this two and a half hours. Um, he he talks about um you know bringing dignity back to being black and you know things of that nature. And we were stripped of our identity. So you're wearing this daishiki, which is West African garb or whatever. But when do you ever get into the West African culture? And we're gonna get back to that, but we're gonna be Christians. Why don't you ever do that? If you're trying to redignify black people in the context of Christianity, why aren't you giving them back any nationality? Why aren't you saying, okay, these are the cultures of West Africa? You know why? Because if you go to them cultures, you're going to realize you can't be Christian and immense in that culture. Being a Christian is assimilation into somebody else's culture and stepping away from that anyway. So you that, that And that is why he has this outfit on, them skinny jeans and that dash. He's showing you. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to put like an African face on, but I'm still these jeans and these New Balances are showing who is really right. down. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to be a roast, right? It's the roast of Eric Mason. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> man, this is crazy, man. Let's get uh, let's get back to this. Um, where are we at now? Uh, okay, yeah, right here. So watch this. Thirty-five. Dylan 35. Watch this. It's another translation, right? Um, they, they uh, uh, key beliefs, and it's, uh, they have uh, a language that they've created called the Lashawan Kadesh. First off, Kadesh is an entirely different Hebrew word. It's Kadesh, and you know that. Devil. Oh, you being a black devil. Yeah. Real black devil, man. Now, what, Probably what, is a Hamite. What, what, watch what he say. So they've taken everything out, all the vowels out that the Masoretes put in in the second century. So he admits that the Masoretes put the vowels in, but in the same breath dismisses that we speak without it. But is admitting that the Masoretes added the vowel points. This dude is a devil, man. <laughs> that is a shame, man. Wow. And he can, it was like I said, he can sit at the front of that podium. And talk and talk and talk and never have to answer any questions. People just say, amen, amen, amen. Sit in front of a room full of people and just lie and don't have to ask no answer no questions about it, man. It's crazy, man. Unbelievable, man. So what were they reading before the Masoretes put it in there, pork chop? <laughs> That's the question. Why, why, why are we speaking about that? Or do I have to speak with the Masoretes spoke? Ridiculous. 
teaming, right. man. All, putting all them dots next to the damn letters. Right. If we, see that on, if we go look at any Paleo Hebrew artifact that's found, right? Be it uh, the Ked of Hinnom scroll, the Kibra Kiafa inscription, we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, oh, um, the Sumerian Pentateuch, um, Amherst 63. If we look at any of these documents, and I don't see dots there, but then all of a sudden later in time, there's dots there. Do I speak with the dots or do I speak without the dots? Right. Why is he so happy with what the Masoretes did? Exactly. Why can't accept that so much? But what was before that is just to ignore it all. This guy's cold, man. Period. Right. Let's uh, let's let's go to the next point. Now watch this. This one is really gonna get good. He's gonna try to break down Deuteronomy twenty-eight and sixty-eight. Right. Oh my God. Enemies for bondsmen. Okay. So now we're saying you'll be sold. I will bondsmen and bondswomen, but listen, and no man shall buy you. Now what does that tell you? No one was bought. Oh, that's what it tells you? No one was bought. It's showing you how, how much you don't know. When they say no man shall buy you, let's show you what that means with Torah precept because he's speaking in the language of the Torah according to precepts that have already pre-existed in the Torah. So we're going to go here. Go ahead, get that, uh, Hassan, Leviticus 25 and 48. Oh, I tell you more. Yeah, how about Shem Yahweh Shah Barak Atah Wathawadah? This is Leviticus chapter 25, verse 48. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. That's what it's talking about, redeeming by your brethren. After you're sold, right? It says you shall be sold as bond women, bond men and bond women. After you're sold, you can be redeemed by one of your brethren, right? Let's see if the New Testament agrees with what we're saying. Galatians 4 and 4 to 5. Go ahead, read that. It says Galatians 4 and 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, Made of a woman, made under the law. Uh, made under the law, read. To redeem them. To do what? To redeem them. To redeem them, right? You can redeem your brother after they get sold, right? To redeem them, read. That were under the law. Derek Yehuda, Yahweh Bashim Yahshah Barakatha, Wath Water, to redeem them that were under the law. Read. That we might receive the adoption of sons. So the Bible agrees that the Most High Yahweh have purchased us or is redeeming us, buying us out of captivity through the blood of Yahweh Shai. This is the truth from Deuteronomy 28 and 68, Leviticus 25 and 45, all the way here in the Galatians. It is the overall truth that rings through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai. That's what that means. Not that no one was bought. If you were sold, nigga, you were bought. Yeah. But it's saying that redemption is not going to come through any man, right? You have some of our people that thought we were going to get redemption through a Martin Luther King, through a Malcolm X. Right. Even more, most recently, a rap artist named Nipsey Hussle, people are acting like he was going to redeem and save black people. The Most High had each one of those men killed to remind you that no man can redeem you, but only the Most High can redeem you through his only begotten son, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shah, that said his blood for you. That's the only way. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a, Isaiah 59. This is prophetic. You see that in prophecy right here. Isaiah 59 and 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion mm. and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. If they turn from transgression, that means they stop sinning and following the law, and they're also in Jacob. So that also is another testament to Christ redeeming, right? Showing you what no man shall buy you, meaning, but also showing you that the law is center, is centric to salvation and Israel exclusive salvation. Yeah. All that, see, three birds with one stone of false claims that you made, one scripture here in the prophecy, right? Go ahead. It says, uh, say it the Lord. There you go. Say if Yahweh, so Yahweh spoke that, right? So that that that's easy. That's it, it's really light work. All right, Eric. Now let's let's watch this idiocracy. Um, where are we at? Uh 39. What they try to do with that Deuteronomy 28 and 68 is they 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 you they read the other versions where it doesn't say you're sold, it says you will offer yourself for sale. And it like watch this, watch this, right? That's how stupid it is. The, the, the verse, and, and this is a very simple, in the Hebrew, 68 is very simple. Anybody can look at this in the Hebrew because it's it's made up of very elementary Hebrew words, so it's simple, right? Yahweh, shawab, right? Meaning you shall return, right? 
Yahweh Shawab, Yahweh shall return you to Matazarium to Egypt. Yahweh shall turn you into Matazarium. Matter of fact, let's let's go into it deep real quick. Because I want to show y'all what Matazarium is talking about, right? Because we know Egypt is the house of bondage. We have Egypt, Egypt, Mizraim, etc., right? Egyptians. Right. This is the word. Ma Tazar Yum. Right. Ma means with Tazar means rocks. I uh, means rock. Yum means plural, meaning with the rocks, among the rocks or essentially between a rock and a hard place. That's actually what the word Egypt means from the Hebraic perspective. I'll further prove it. Ma Tazar. Right. Let's go here. Ma Tazar. <clears throat> Egypt, the border. Right. Boom. Egypt. Right. Siege. A siege. Right. If you're in siege, what are you? You're between a rock and a hard place. Right. Ma Tazar. Again, it's showing you, uh, right? Siege enclosed a siege, an entrenchment, a siege, right? You're trapped like somebody's invading you. Now, let's go here. Tazar, the word Tazar. What does it mean? Uh, besiege, confine, shut in, enclosed, besiege, to show hostility to, be an adversary to, treat as a foe. So this is a place, when, when we see Egypt, it's, it's referring to a place where we're being besieged, where we're having hostility showed to us, we're being, people are being adverse to us there, we're being treated as a foe there. <laughs> That's what this is dealing with, right? Uh, and it doesn't make any sense. So you guys are saying that the Israelites were forced to go on slave ships just so they can go to Egypt, and then when they get to Egypt, they're gonna go offer themselves for sale, but there'll be nobody to buy it. So it doesn't make no sense. So how are they gonna, so, how are they going to offer themselves for sale if they're being forced on these boats anyway? Or are they not being forced to force on the boats? Are they getting on the boats on their own and then trying to sell themselves? That, that, that doesn't make no sense, man. All of it is retarded. Let's just call it what it is, right? So here's the, also the word Tazawar, right? Same thing, Tazar. Constraint, distress. <laughs> it's a place where you're distressed. Let's take it back etymologically to constrain, press, bring into straight, straighten, oppress. So exactly. what happened to us here? So the term Egypt in truth is pointing to being oppressed. That's what it means, really. You are caught up on a geographical locale when the word itself is just reflecting us being oppressed, us being in between a rock and a hard place. That's what it means. So y'all make sure y'all remember y'all study the etymology of these words because it screws them over every time. But again, it says, Yahweh Shawab, Yahweh shall return you, Matazarium into Egypt, Shawab, he shall return you, Anaya, with ships, right? Now, he shall return you now with ships, the rock in the way, Amar, that I said, Ra'ah, you shouldn't see. Uh, Yasaf, again, you shouldn't see again. I'm going to return you by ships in a way where I said I, you wouldn't see again, is what it's saying. Makar, to be sold. Ayab, meaning to your enemies or to the people that hate you. That's what Ayab or Ayawab means in Hebrew. It means to like people that hate you or people who show hate towards you, right? Ibad, which means slave. Shapaka, which means slave woman. Kuna, right? And that's that note that's dealing with redemption that nobody should redeem you. That's what it's, it's very simple. The Hebrew reflects verbatim how we teach it and how the King James has translated it. But here they come with this madness nowadays trying to give you the remix. Right saying that that happened in 70 AD with the white Jews. So basically what these guys are trying to tell us now without saying it is that the white man went to slavery on slave ships. Which is madness. Guys, it's crazy. New history all, all of a sudden out of nowhere because we're figuring out where the Israelites. Now the white man's went to slavery on slave ships. It's unbelievable, man. Incredible. The Lord will take you back in ships to Egypt. By a route that I said you would never see again. Now, mind, is, mind you, now this is the, 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 the CSB is reading. He said, by the route which I said you would never see again, right? Right. So if God sent us back into Egypt in a way that he said he wouldn't, didn't that make him a liar? Yep. See how they're trying to make God a liar? Yep. By following the white man here and affirming their theories about the Bible, he is attempting to make God a liar, and he doesn't even realize it while he sits there and sips whatever homosexual tea he's drinking. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> whatever sweet, whatever sweet sugar in the tank tea he's drinking. Right. right. And I'm not saying the man is a homosexual. I'm saying that that tea is gay. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may be giving the brother tendencies. He may need to cut that out of his diet. Right. <laughs> Maybe a lot of estrogen. Right. In there. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Let's go. There you will sell yourself to the enemy, male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. 
That, that, that is retarded. Let's just be honest with what that interpretation is. Retarded. <laughs> and, and, and listen, and nothing short of it. Now watch this. Watch more retarded. Y'all ready for more retardation or, or what? <laughs> Let's get into some more retard Bible blunders and retardation from, from alleged PhD scholars, right? Watch this. You don't have to know any of it, okay? Read verse 14 and 15 for me. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Stop. Man. What? His head and his hairs were like white like wool. Again? His head and his hairs were white like wool. So his head is what? See that? You see that sugar in the tank? Y'all yeah, seen the sugar yeah, in the tank? Yeah. Right there. That, that's from that damn tea he's drinking. Yeah. Right. See, you see how you got readers now? Yeah. When did he ever have readers? <laughs> These guys is crazy. Like I said, we know we know they're learning from us. <laughs> and they want to be like us in <laughs> some ways, and they're they're emulating. <laughs> why do you think they want to we gotta take it to the streets now? Yeah, we're gonna take it to the streets. Vocab Malone didn't had readers. Now this guy got a reader up here. And he was making fun of it, making fun of us for that a minute ago. But when you're gonna actually start breaking down scriptures. I think they found out that it's easier to have somebody else read for you, you know, because they don't usually go to the church and break down anything. They just read one scripture and then run their mouth. So they don't need to read it. Exactly. The Greek word for head is head. <laughs> oh, man. Now, now, yeah, now, I want everyone to remember he said that. Everyone remember he said that. Watch right. that. Keep reading. As white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Stop. Now, what color is his ankles, his feet and stuff? What is it? It didn't say brown. Don't add to the words. Brown. That's not what it said. What does it say? Fine brass. Like brass. Like burnt like brass. Now, if brass is being burnt, it actually lights up to bright orange. Okay, let's see if that's true. We're supposed to just believe it because he said it. Let, let, let's let's see if that's true, guys. That sounds a little cult, cultish. You know, you're supposed to take the leader <laughs> his word for you. Right. Yeah, didn't it didn't sound like a cult. Let's uh let's see if what he's saying is true. This is now this is from a YouTuber. Named the gun toting atheist. He's a white atheist. So I don't think he has any bias in this matter, right? I think it's safe to conclude this man is no bias, he's right? Never, he hasn't had a dog in this the fight. The dog in this fight. He's a white atheist who taking the two, two, three cell case, one of my favorites, and burning it. Right. So let's see what happens. Let's see if it turns bright orange. So here he is. He puts the flame to it. Is it bright orange? The flame is orange, but is the brass orange? I don't see it turning orange yet. Okay, the flame is out. You got to add a little bit more flame to it. Nice blowtorch, industrial blowtorch. Oh, there you go. Is it is it turning orange? Y'all see it turn orange yet? It ain't turn orange yet. Oh, it's it's it looks like it's getting black. Look look how dark it's getting. It hasn't turned orange yet. Hmm. No, no, no! You're tripping, bro. The, the 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 type of brass that they saw wasn't a bullet shell casing. It was a big block of brass that actually glowed. <laughs> look at look at this. Look at that. Look pretty black to me. Let's go to another one. It's like, so where's the uh, where's the Greek Matthew? <laughs> yeah, and I'm still looking for the fucking Greek Matthew. So lucky for my my language, but I'm still looking for the Greek Matthew. So here here he is. He put this one on a burner. Now see, the burner is turning bright orange, like he alleges brass turns, but is the brass turning that? Brass is getting darker. Damn liars. Looks pretty brown to me. And uh, oh yeah, oh look at that. Look at look at what it turned. Look how dark that thing is. Ooh. So we see the this is he's alleging that the brass acts like how this burner acts, but yeah. instead it gets black. That's the same skin color. It looks like my dad's skin tone right there. Uh yeah, that 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 this is ridiculous, man. You're a liar. <laughs> Point blank period. You're a god 
damn liar, meaning God condemns you for lying. You're a liar. It doesn't turn bright orange. You have per per perpetrated a fraud in this instance in order to protect the same white supremacy that you allege you call out. It's crazy. Now watch this. A liar, man. Get a uh, uh, get uh, Revelations four, and I'm gonna do you one better than Revelations one. Get Revelations four, and also real quick, Eric Mason. Um, just so you know, because he tried to say, oh, and then when you go do a real lexicon, not the strong. Just so you know, I utilize the Bowers, and in the Bowers, etymologically, the word that is utilized for brass in uh, Revelations one and fifteen actually goes back to copper. Which is an actually an even darker brown metal, so that actually screws you even worse, pal. Um, but watch this. Go ahead. Revelation chapter four, verse three. Uh huh. It says, um, "And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone." These are jasper and sardine stones. Him that sit on the throne, right? The Most High. They believe in the Trinity, so God or Christ, same thing, right? Uh, this is jasper and sardine stones. That, that kind of looks like along the lines of burnt brass. We're talking about a dark brown man. See that? Jasper and sardine. Hair of wool. You see that? Eric Mason, what in the hell are you talking about, man? What are you talking about? Matter of fact, watch this. Revelation. Right. Watch this. I'm, 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 I'm going to show you how cold, how much colder it gets. Right? A jasper and a sardine stone. So watch what we do with the sardine. Sardinos. Watch this. A sardine stone, a precious stone of which there are two types. The former is called carnelian, right? Corn, which means flesh, right? Where you get the word carnal from, where the, uh, the Spanish gets the carne, uh, when you get carne asada, which is a flesh that's cooked under the asada seasoning, right? Because flesh colored. Whose flesh is that color that we just showed you? Oh, black, uh, black people also who have woolly textured hair, coincidentally, right? You were crazy. Yeah, you got to understand something, Eric Mason. We, we're we not crazy. We, we didn't just start doing this. The Most High God really woke these brothers up that you're talking about and talking to. Period. Um, it's just crazy. All right, what's the next point? What else I got on him? Uh, let's keep going. Oh, we watch this, y'all. Yeah. Now, now, mind y'all, watch this. Remember what, what I said to remember? He said that right. the head means head, so his head is white. Is what he said. Right. Right? Remember that. Watch this. And so when you look at, you don't even have the now. Read, read that in the CSB translation, brother. Read, read that joint in the CSB. We will, we will get it in the modern translation. So let, the modern translation, because he says it's more accurate, right? That's why he uh, cleaves to more modern translations, right? Read. We'll get it in the CSB translation. Read, read that for me real quick. Go ahead. The hair of his head was white as wool. <laughs> So, mind you, he said earlier, right, that when it says head in K in the KJV, it's talking about his whole head. But <laughs> his updated translation is in accordance to what we say the KJV is saying, that the hair of his head, that head means right. that, that, that his head and his hair is just dealing with the hair on his head and on his beard. That's what it's talking about. And the CSB, the, tr the, the, the translation that he loves and extols, agrees with us there. But notice he don't even he don't bring that up. Nah, he just read right over it, man, and act like it didn't say that. He, he later on he goes, and, and from what I know, the face is part of the head, right? So his whole head, basically, his whole head is white. His face and everything is just white. Dude is crazy, man. That, that this, I mean, it's, it's it's madness. It is madness. Watch this. Brass is is, 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 is is talking about royal prowess. Man. But it's he don't have time to preach it. It's talking about royal prowess. <laughs> there is no reference to brass meaning royal power prowess. You're a liar and an idiot. All right. Where did you, get that? <laughs> you made that up. Right? Now let's go. Give me Ezekiel 40 and 3 real quick. The same man. It's just that every angelic being or special being like Christ and the angels are all just described like this. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. Right. Ezekiel chapter 40, <clears throat> verse 3. Let's see what this says. It says, and he, and he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man 
whose appearance was like the appearance of brass. Of brass. <laughs> See that? So now we have Christ is brass. This angel looked like brass, right? Is that royal prowess? No, the nigga looked like brass. Meaning he oh, yeah. looked like how you look, Eric Mason. Go ahead. It says, um, whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. Let's go to Daniel 10 and 6. Let's look at another angel. Right. Let's see what color he was. Daniel chapter 10, <laughs> verse 5, or verse 6. It says, um, his body was like the barrel, uh -huh. and his face is the appearance of lightning, mm -hmm. and his eyes as lamps of fire, mm -hmm. and his arms. And his arms, and what? And his feet. And his feet, read on. Like in color to polished brass. Like in color to what? Polished brass. Polished brass. We know that word polished. You look it up in Hebrew, it's burnished. Burnt brass, read. And the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. There you go. So we have two different angels and Christ all being described to look like burnt brass or brass in appearance. Brown. Not royal prowess. <laughs> Whatever in the hell that is that you, of course, conveniently don't have time to teach on because there's nothing to teach on because you or some damn devil made it up. And there's no scriptures that point to this nonsense. Be honest with yourself, man. What type of dignified, self-respecting black man is this dishonest with himself? Let's go to 48 minutes. Watch this. Yeah, but what he, even what's crazy about that is how he's reading the hair in his head and, and making it seem like we're crazy, but they'll never go to Daniel 7 and 9 and read that the Heavenly Father himself had the hair of wool. Well, first off, they'll contend that the Heavenly Father is spirit, yet here we have a, a, a body being described. Right. We have somebody with hair of wool who, according to Revelations, has a skin color of jasper and sardine stone that's right. sitting on a throne. Right. Somebody who has a body. <laughs> But he's spirit. But then they say you're carnal and you're fit. Your spiritual identities are different. But wait, this guy has a spirit, yet he looks like how we look in the flesh. Right. So that lets you know you still have a look in your spirit. Right? Uh, yeah, man. They think when you're a spirit, you're invisible. <laughs> just, just floating around. Just madness. Right? Now watch this at 48. This is when it's getting ready to get bad right here. Y'all y'all pay attention to this. Taste of the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Hit it up. This is what the Christians go yeah. for the gospel. Listen close to this. CSB? Yeah. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold to the message I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Yeah. For I passed on to you as most important. Let's say that again. Most, most important. Say it again. Most important. Yeah, read it. What I also received that Christ died for our sins yeah. according to the scriptures. Yeah. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So 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 go back. He said it's a what importance? Most. What's your nationality? <laughs> um he, he's an idiot. All right, here's why. Because it said what is most important is that we should be saved from our sins according to the scriptures. That's what was most important. So all of that has directly to do with nationality because it says our sins according to scriptures. You cannot show me any scripture where all people or some multi-ethnic church were promised that somebody died for their sins. That's nowhere in the Bible. But according to scriptures, our sins, meaning the Israelites, was died for. So there is nationality right there in 1 Corinthians 15, the verse that you went to. Let's prove it. Isaiah 53 and 5. This is book of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh-huh. He was bruised for our iniquity. So this is a prophecy about Christ dying for our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions and our iniquities. Read on. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, uh -huh. and with his stripes we are healed. We are healed, right? Go to 8. Verse 8. He was taken from prison uh -huh. and from judgment. Read on. And who shall declare his generation? Uh -huh. For he was cut off out of the land of the living uh -huh. for the transgression of my people. Of my people. God said he was cut off for the transgression of my people. Let's see who my people is. Finish that. Uh, for the transgression of my people, must uh -huh. be stricken. Right. So go to 52 and 1. Let's see contextually who Isaiah is addressing here. 
right? Read 52 and 1. Isaiah 52 and 1. Uh -huh. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. So he's talking to Zion, right? That's the audience that's being told that for their collective, whereas Isaiah said, our transgressions, right? Zion, finish that. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, uh -huh. the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come un sorry. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Boom. So Zion is the audience here. So let's further prove who the my people, the most high is talking about is first Kings six and thirteen. This is first Kings chapter six, verse thirteen. Read on. And I will dwell among the children of Israel. Um, the children of Israel. I will. Who? Yahweh. Will dwell the most high, will dwell amongst the children of Israel. Read on. And will not forsake my people. Will not forsake who? My people. My people who? Israel. My people who? Israel. So who is the my people God said that his suffering servant would die for the sins of? Israel. So there is nationality right there in the verse that you read, because according to the scriptures, our sins to be died for is something that exclusively pertains to the Israelites. No, but the new Israel is all those who are in Christ. See that? And where is that at in the Bible? And then on top of that, here's how here's how stupid he is. He at the end of this lecture goes, and we as Christians got to understand that everything in the New Testament has something in the Old Testament. That from. <laughs> he said that, and you're right, including that verse that your dumbass just went to. <laughs> yeah, we grimy, all right. We're gonna show you grimy. Right. <laughs> they're, they're, winging. they're really winging it, man. We're gonna show you grimy, right? So let's go to a. Uh, 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 well, we, uh, yeah, Matthew, go ahead, that Matthew. Let's see if the New Testament reaffirms that God's people are still Israel or not. Read. Matthew 2 and 6. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. Mm -hmm. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Mm -hmm. Ooh, my people Israel. See that? My people Israel. That's who the people of the Most High are. That's who it was prophesied according to the scriptures whose sins should be died for. No one else, buddy. So, yes, there's nationality right there while you're sitting there with that dumbass look on your face. I don't know how you got your hands in them slim ass pockets either. That's crazy. <laughs> look at that. How did how is that even physically possible? He's about to squeeze, he's about to burst. <laughs> read, read, look, ridiculous, right? Let's go here. This this crazy brother. Uh where we at? Boom. Matthew 121. Uh well, we already hit Matthew 121. Uh uh uh. uh let me go Matthew or Salakia. Oh, 53. 53. Watch this. 53. 27. More. Y'all buckle up. Watch this. We're going we're gonna to just let this play for about two minutes. Watch this. James. Oh, I got it. I got it. Hold on. I got that. Oh, you got it? Okay, got you. Got you. My bad. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save them? Save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your, your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. Yeah. You believe that God is one. Good. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. Senseless person. You stop it. You stop it. You stop it. You good. You good. You good. So what you see is when they'll go to this passage and say, "Yeah, we believe in faith, but we believe in faith plus works." And what they'll do is they'll say, "You're not just you're not just justified by faith alone. You're justified by faith and works." And so they'll use this passage as a mechanism to do that. And the average Christian will be like, Dang, "That sounds weird." Know, know how weird this is? You're not, in, you're, you're not in bad company, okay? Because Martin Luther wanted to tear the book of James out of the canon because he he had, he had, he had, he discovered Romans 5.1 and was blown away that we're justified by faith. But as he was reading through his Bible and got to James, he was like, how does this, how does this, even Luther was trying to, Martin Luther was trying to, Martin, not Martin Luther King, for y'all be like, Martin Luther King? I saw some of y'all said, wow. Right. He's like standing bow legged, not me. I mean. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, I thought I'm talking about Martin Luther, the the reformer, the white German dude, right? <laughs> so I was like, how do you know Martin Luther King was in it like that? He's exegeting it. What I know is I have a dream. Right? He was in that text. So 
So this is what we're going to do. Answer. How do you answer? Notice, he does not break down James 2. He just did all that. We just played two minutes, y'all. They read it. He doesn't break it down. He just says, I understand, yeah, Christians don't know what to do with that. Even Martin Luther, you know, the white boy that is, you know, wanted to exterminate Jews and hated black people and things of that nature who I follow wholeheartedly and earnestly, even that white boy didn't know what to do with James 2. And then just kind of leaves it there. <laughs> Man, it's it, it's it's really crazy, man. It's really crazy. Let's uh let's keep going now though. Go to 56 26. Right there. Boom. The son has life. Uh-huh. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. Uh-huh. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Who do you have life by? The who? The works of the law. <laughs> I thought you had to do the works of the law in order to have life. Wow. Oh, that's interesting you say this because <laughs> you're right. We have eternal life through the Son. You're right. Let's see what the Son said. Matthew 19, 16 to 17. Read that. Matthew 19 and 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That I may have. So he's. I'm acknowledging you, Christ. He's calling him good master. You the way. You're the path, right? To to, to you're the way, the truth, and the life. So what do I got to do to have this eternal life, right? The son, right? Read. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Uh -huh. There is none good but one, and that is God. Uh -huh. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Oh, if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. <laughs> Just kind of like how faith and works go together. The son and keeping the commandments, they go together. It's faith and works. The hell is I just want to look at what in the hell are you talking about, doctor? The and you need a doctor. Right. The, the commandments of Christ. <laughs> Remember, okay, he's guess here. what? That, guess what? That's next. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. The new law and the law of Christ is right now. I'm having this other side is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> this is what we've been waiting for. And don't forget, he said one of the laws of Christ is to wash each other's feet. <laughs> but he don't wash feet. A hypocrite but, liar. Hey, look, look. One of the laws of Christ is to wash people's feet, allegedly, right? But he don't wash feet, yet he claims that he fulfills the law. But I thought Jesus was the one who fulfilled the law. <laughs> what is this nigga talking about? Only the Christian pastor can do something like that in front of his believers and followers and them not ask one single solitary question. He it's, asked, brother. totally unchecked. Right. He Because the brother aside asked him, Hey, man, do you keep the laws of God? He said, do I keep the laws of God? He was like, yes. He said, I fulfill them. <laughs> wow. You know how proud you got to be to even say that? <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> <laughs> that goes on all the time, and they're able to just do it, and it's nothing. Okay. Unbelievable, man. Here, let's go to this now. In commandments in the New Testament, Unless it's specifically verified, there is a new law and commandments we're under. He said there's a new law and commandments we're under. That's interesting. Let's go to John 13 and 34, and let's see if there is a new law and new commandments. We're going to go to the one time where Christ said, a new commandment I give you, right? Let's 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 read it. John 13 and 34, a new commandment I give unto you. So Christ said, I'm giving you a year. This is the new commandment, right? Let, let's see what it is. New commandment, read. That you love one another. Oh, go ahead. As I have loved you, uh -huh. that you also love one another. Love one another. Hmm. Let's go to, that's new? I think I read that somewhere, y'all. Do y'all, does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> Leviticus 19 and 17. Leviticus 19 and 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. If I can't hate you, what does that mean? I got to love you, <laughs> right? The opposite of love is hate. Hate is the opposite of love, right? Thou shalt not hate your brother, meaning you shall love him, read. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. See that? So that's not a new commandment, right? But you know, if you study Greek, Eric Mason, that that word for new also deals with renewing and refreshing. So what Yahweh Shai was doing, who you call Christ is doing there, is re-emphasizing a law that had escaped from post-exilic Israelites that were ruled by hypocritical Pharisees. That's what was going on. Who have omitted the weightier parts of the law, which he rebuked them for right and left certain parts of the law undone and this was one of them so he refreshed it in the mind of his disciples 
point blank period. Let's now go to first John five and three, because you talk all this love, love God and love neighbor. Well, again, what is love? How do we love God and neighbor? Read that. First John five and three. Uh -huh. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments mm -hmm. and his commandments are not grievous. Mm -hmm. That we keep his commandments and the commandments are not grievous. This is this is crazy. Oh, so vocab, you're bragging about speaking Greek. Um, you have no idea how hilarious that is. And other and, and Eric, I bet Eric Mason can speak Greek. It sounds it sounds right up his alley, huh? You top. Yes, it does. Without without, without seven years. <laughs> tight ass pants on. You know, uh, uh, I I don't think speaking that speaking Greek has any credence really to what we're talking about here. And I know he can speak Greek, which is why I just made the statement that I made. No one Western could speak Greek. Who first off, who cares? But all the Greek, that we have Greek lexicons that help us decipherment things. Then so, you know, because your congregation can't speak Greek, can they contend for the faith? And do they know what the Bible is talking about? Right. All the Greek you guys understand. What would make him say he fulfills the law? Like he's Christ. Is there something sure. read in the Greek that we didn't understand? Do you fulfill the law? Are you Christ vocab? Hey, and where is the Greek Matthew that he said he had? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and another and another question. Um, why did he misquote what the word fulfillment in the Greek and then brought out an entirely separate definition in this lecture? If he's a Greek expert. And another thing, why did he only read Matthew five and seventeen, and then turn around and tell us that the only way we can get the understanding is or get the context is is if we read the whole thing? Damn hypocrites. Oh, vocab, you can't speak Greek. Well, again, vocab, we, we both know that we use lexicons and things of that nature to decipher Greek. So why, if it was on his phone, why he ain't pull it out? <laughs> the kids, hey, look, the kids are laughing at you. Right, right, right. <laughs> the kids are laughing at Eric Mason, right? So again, it tells us to love. How do we know how to love? For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So we don't know how to love and what love is unless we go back to the commandments that elaborate and build off of loving God and neighbor, right? That tell us you don't do this or you don't do that. It tells us that because that is showing us how to love and what love is. It's giving us a guideline. We're not just making it up as we go along, right? So where we at? Boom. Let's go to the next point. The law of Christ. <laughs> okay, buckle up. All right. This is going to be the next frontier for y'all. Um. Where we at? Fifty nine oh eight. No worries. We're gonna come back to that. Grab Galatians yeah. six two for me. Grab Galatians six two for me. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So, what is the law of Christ? So, what is the law of Christ? That's a great question. Well, let's let's find out. Um, my first question is this. Matter of fact, vocab, vocab, you could answer this, and I believe you would answer the same way that Eric Mason would. Vocab Malone is Christ God. I'm gonna... How do I get in that chat? Oh, uh, you gotta go go to go to the Sakari um YouTube. You could pull up on your phone and get in. Vocab is Christ God. Get in vocab, send a super chat, like the brother Ernie said. That's a tremendous uh suggestion. Let's get up to you. You send in fifty. We'll do a your time. We'll do a freestyle, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, uh, yeah. So vocab is Christ God. Where is he at, man? He was just deep. Okay, he said Christ is God, but he's not the Father. Okay, but Christ is God, right? That's all I'm asking. Is Christ God? We understand there's an economic role according to the Trinity. I understand, but I just want to know he's God. They say he's God, right now. Mind y'all, they just said Christ is God, right? He said they say there's a law of Christ. Then they say Christ is God. Nehemiah 8 and 1, please. <laughs> Watch this, y'all. This is how you get them when they come with this law of Christ madness. They say he's God right now. Mind y'all, they just said Christ is God, right? Oh, man, mute, man. Mute that. Christ. Then they say Christ is God. Nehemiah 8 and 1, please. <laughs> Watch this, y'all. This is how you get them when they come. I got to mute myself. This guy. <laughs> 
Read that. Nehemiah 8 and 1. On top verse 1. Okay. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street uh -huh. before the water gate. Read on. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe mm -hmm. to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So Ezra comes with the book of the law of Moses, right? And he's teaching it to the Israelites. Let's skip to verse 8. Verse 8. So they read in the book in the law of God. What did they read? The law of God. The law of God. So the law of Moses is also called the law of God. So if Christ is God, then the law of Moses is the law of Christ. Is that game set and match yet? If you are telling me there's a law of Christ, but Christ is God, and the law of Moses is called the law of God, then the law of Christ is the law of Moses. They are interchangeable. They're one of the same. There's no separation of the two. That's number one. Since you believe God, since you believe Christ is God. <laughs> See how that starts to work against you? You know when it's a fallacy? When it starts to collapse upon itself. You get the runner out at first, but my runner scores at the plate, right? For those of, of y'all that are baseball aficionados that are in the listening audience. So now watch this. Let's go to Exodus 18 and 16 to reaffirm this. We already proved that Christ didn't give new commandments. All right, we're not even worried about that. That commandment he said was new was nothing new, right? So let's go to yeah, Exodus 18 and 16. Exodus 18 and 16. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one another. Uh -huh. And I do make them know the statutes of God uh -huh. and his law. Again, his law. That's what Moses made them know. So the law of Moses is the law of God. And if you believe in the Trinity, you believe Christ is God. So the law of Christ and the law of Moses is one and the same and the law of God, right? Further prove that. Let's go to Daniel 9 and 10. Yeah, he's not, he's not even fine. Right? He's got nothing to say. Daniel chapter 9, verse 10. It says, Neither have we obeyed the voice of Yahweh our God to walk in his laws, which he said before us by the by his servants, the prophets. So God has laws that he gave us by a service to prophets. That's the old testament, quote unquote, laws. But you believe Christ is God. Therefore, you believe the law of Christ is the law. They're interchangeable. They cannot be separated again. I just want to re-emphasize this so y'all can understand. When they come with that law of Christ thing, you ask them if Christ is God, and you go right there to show that the law of Moses is called the law of God. You can't get around it. And go to the time, the one time where Christ said he gave a new commandment, and go back to Leviticus and show you that that commandment is not new. All right? That's out. Nice try. Let's move on. Um. Oh yeah. Oh, one oh eight. Okay. One oh eight, thirteen and sixteen. Say you're justified by faith. You know he's saying no. If you're a real believer, you will be obedient. You're right, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. If you're a real believer, you will be obedient. That's biblical. Give me Sirach thirty two and twenty four. If he says if you're a real believer, you'll be obedient. I agree totally. If you really have faith and you really believe, you're going to strive to keep the laws because you really believe and you were predestined to do so. Sirach, read. Sirach 32 and 24. Uh -huh. He that believeth in the Lord mm -hmm. taketh heed to the commandments. See that? If you believe, you're going to follow the laws. <laughs> it's what that says, right? But, oh, we don't believe in the apocrypha. Fine. Let's, get, let's see if Christ reaffirms that. Matthew 21 and 32. Matthew chapter 21, verse 32. It says, for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. Mm -hmm. But the publicans in the harvest believed him, and ye, and when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So what Yahweh just said was the people who believed what the prophet John the Baptist, John Baptist said, they repented. They believed, so they repented. They had faith, and that faith compelled them into action, which is repentance, right? So let's understand what repentance is, Acts 3 and 19. This is Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. It says, repent ye therefore and be converted. Repent and be converted. That's what it says. Repent and be converted. Okay, cool. So if I'm repenting, I must be converted. How am I converting, right? Finish that. We're going to find out what conversion is because this is going to answer what repentance is, right? Read. That your sins may be blotted out. That your sins may be blotted out. So you can't think that continuing in sin will get your sins blotted out. Sin is transgression of the law. So it's literally... 
oxymoronic to believe that the continuance of a lifestyle of sin is going to blot out sins. That's ridiculous. Finish that. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Okay. Psalms 19 and 7. There's a book of Psalms chapter 19 and verse 7. Mm -hmm. The law of the Lord is perfect, mm -hmm. converting the soul. So he said repent and be converted. The law converts the soul. So how do you repent and be converted? You must follow the law. So when Yahweh says, if you believed, you would have repented. And repentance is conversion. Conversion is through the law. Then he's saying, if you believed, you would have stopped sinning and started following the law instead of breaking it. So Yahweh Shai is saying the same thing. If you believe, you'll be obedient. Same thing Sirach says. So it all, if, if y'all notice throughout this whole presentation, we've showed how everything points back to Yahweh Shai and then Yahweh Shai points back to the law. He's saying, we got to, this is what we have to do. This is what the Most High wants us to do, right? So go ahead. God, the testimonies. Oh, oh yeah, go select. Like the it. testimony of the Lord is sure, uh -huh. making wise the simple. Boom. That's point blank period, right? So now let's get into this. Let's get into something great. Hang on real quick. Go ahead, King. This guy's a, a a real mental magician because he's sitting in front of these people telling them to be obedient, making it seem as if he's telling them to do what God says at the same time teaching them not to do what God says. <laughs> it's <laughs> unbelievable how he's doing it though. It's Ain't that something? I wonder, I wonder what devil he learned that from. That seminary school and vocab is just as good at it. Well, no. Nah. Sweet has been a Jerry Phoenix seminary fun. <laughs> 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 oh, well, he went to Dallas. Sweet has been a Jerry Dallas seminary fun. <laughs> oh, man. man, this is crazy. You shall know them by their fruit. That's what it's talking about. This guy's sitting out here saying, be obedient, but. That law, we don't have to keep that law. Only laws we have to keep is if it's specified, specifically. If he said, if he didn't say specifically, then it's okay to go have sex with your dog in the backyard. These guys are crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, and real quick, everybody in the chat, man, just go ahead and leave vocab alone, man. Don't worry about it. We may have it's another, deba we may have another debate or something like that. So don't don't worry about it. All right, Kick him out. block him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Guys, a bunch of haters. You can't. We can't be in their little thing. They kick us out so fast. It's retarded. Yeah, who's cussing, man? Who's cussing at people? Don't be cussing at people in there, man. Everybody act like you got some sense. It's okay, guys. It's all right. You see what we're doing to these people. All right. Don't worry. We've got it. <laughs> We've got it covered. <laughs> uh, uh, let's go here. This is then when it gets real good, right? Now, vocal, you better watch your boy right here, man. Cause he did something slick and we're going to show it, man. And you're going to see it right now. It's going to be undeniable. Watch this. Where we at? 14, 114 to Where I'm at? Oh, I'm right here. Okay. 114. Okay. They, they think it, they say it means to do the law. Okay. First off, he's lying. Nobody says that when it says Christ came to fulfill the law, that means to do it. We never said that. We know it's talking about to fulfill the prophecies that are in regards to him that are in the law, right? He is now creating a straw man that we contend, Hebrew Israelites, that fulfill the law means to do the law. No one has ever said that. He's going to expertly build this straw man and beat it up, but he's going to do it with a combination and a pair of gloves that he got off of Hassad Karab, the officer that he got in this exchange with Hassad. Hassad showed him a combo. And, and, and lent him a pair of boxing gloves here that he didn't know about and he got slapped up with. Then he proceeds to go outside of the ring to the punching bag and practice it on the punching bag here. Okay? <laughs> That's what Eric Mason does and y'all gonna watch it. Now, if fulfilled means to do the law, that means fulfilled means to do the prophets. Exactly. That's oxymoronic, which is why no one has ever said that and you're a fool for even attempting to try to put that on us. Now, let me ask you a question. Matthew talks about, or Luke, talks about Jesus going into his parents, taking him into Egypt. He was a baby. Then it said when he returned, he said, out of Egypt, I've called my son. Did Jesus do that or did his parents take him? Did his parents do that or did he do it? His parents. So his parents do it, and it says this is written in order that the prophet may be fulfilled if if fulfilled means do, 
He didn't do anything. He was passively active in it. But it was God providentially utilizing his parents to bring it to pass, but he didn't do it himself. So fulfill always means do, then it can't mean that all the time. You're right. And it's crazy because it sounds like he's beating us up, but we've never said that. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's illogical to think that. We agree, and we've never said that. Liar. Do you notice how you have to make yourself look good is through a lie? That's bad. Yeah. That's why you have to have good lexicons. And we have those. Bowers, Lido, and Scott, things of that nature. Now, um, now, now, now look at this. So they'll pull out a bunch of verses on law keeping from the old. Hmm. And then they'll pull out verses in actual. Now watch this. Y'all see these verses? These are the same verses that Hassan cut him with. This was that he cut him with two months ago. <laughs> the nigga bringing them out now like they're his. He learned these from this man. <laughs> yeah, you see that? Man, at the mouth of babes. <laughs> now, the, now the doctor had to learn from a 20-year-old on a street corner. Man, for free, too. For free. Yeah. <laughs> for free. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's no telling how much everybody in that room had to pay to get up in there. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. And first John on the law that have to do with the law of Christ, like we saw earlier. So um, let, let's grab those verses. John, so what does fulfill mean? Go ahead, John 19, verses 28 through 30. Go ahead, hit that up. After this, when Jesus... Yeah, but he, again, he's going to go into this, and it's hilarious because he was... This brother showed him. So let's go into these clips here. Yes. Right? Yes. Let's let's show how this how Asai Karab already had taught this guy this lesson, and then he went in and taught it like he got it from seminary school, and he's cutting <laughs> us with it, with what we cut him with. That's crazy. <laughs> Ain't that that that's that that's damn, that's that's seriously that's scandalous. <laughs> Watch this. When you look at fulfill, fulfill, fulfill means to bring to completion. Okay. That this is not even what he's saying. Fulfill means in his presentation. He's he has a different answer here. When we talk about bringing it to completion, um, when but he fulfills the law. It means to bring it to its full completion. Messiah came. That's not what you just said. It means, but okay. To fulfill the law, what did that mean? Uh -huh. he, he came to make sure that everything that God said, that Yahweh said, um, came to its full completion in the Lord. In, in like, respect, and, like, and then we go over to Galatians. That's why. That's why Hassan asked him, "In what respect?" He says that everything comes to its full completion. Okay, in what respect? That's a valid question because Christians oftentimes contend that it means that the law is complete now. There's no need for it, right? But that's why. Hassad is asking in what respect, because if it's about the prophecies that are refer to the suffering of Yahweh Shai, you're correct. But if you think it's about the law in totality, you're incorrect. So he's making sure to ask him to qualify what it means by bringing the things in the law to its full completion. The man instead does not answer that. He runs somewhere else. Watch this. So he now is talking about something else. He's now mentioned <laughs> fulfilling the law. And what fulfill means, and it's now ran to Galatians. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Interesting, right? So let's move a little later on in our coverage. Right here. You said that uh, fulfill the law. Let me show you what fulfill the law is. Yeah. Let me show you. So now, because he doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. And it's clear <laughs> after two minutes of hearing a nigga talk to Hassan, Officer Hassan Karab, this nigga don't know. Yeah, so, I, so let me tell him. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, so I, so I get, but. When I said, uh, you said fulfill the law means, I'm in my head, I'm thinking, wait, wait a minute, he didn't say anything. So that's why I'm like, okay, I'll just show you. Since you didn't give an answer, I'm just going to show you what it means. Hey, since you clearly don't, first off, Yatab, look at this nigga face. <laughs> yeah, look, look at his face. He's that nigga's nervous, right. man. He's he nervous. He don't know what's going on. <laughs> He's looking at this little punk kid and going, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I know he got on some skinny jeans too, man. Oh, would he have on skinny jeans this day? Oh, yeah, the skinniest of jeans. I don't <laughs> yeah. care, you gotta walk around speedo tight jeans, man. You know how the damn elves, the same as elves, had them tights. Them, they went them tights. That's what he had on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we. That's that's incredible. This is the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 16. See, he done ran to the phone. He don't even know what to do. He even ran to the phone. He's trying to pull it out. Name through faith. What? If, if he knows 
this, this is how we got him in that in that lie. If he knows, if he already knew these scriptures prior to me going to him, why does he need to go to his phone? Right. Now, mind you, now look at this. Hold on. Let's go back. 3 and 18 is what he calls. This is the scripture he has here. Notice it. Acts 3 and 18. This is the scripture he calls and this nigga don't know about. Look at Acts chapter 3 verse 18. But those things which God before had shewed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he has so fulfilled. That's what it means to fulfill the law. All the prophecies concerning his death, burial, and resurrection, he fulfilled. It doesn't mean that we don't do the law. What you got? So he's cutting him off at Luke 24 and 44. But, but wait, ain't that what he got right here? <laughs> wow. Are you kidding me? Look at this nigga, man. He's cutting him off. He's combating this. Now he took the same, the same playbook. And when he presented it to his church, like he knows what the hell he's talking about. And this is why we call him the pork chop pastor, man. You guys are demons, man. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. I didn't even know it was like that. I didn't even realize what I was watching. <laughs> Nobody did. <laughs> wow. Nobody did. <laughs> he's trying to cut him over because I like wait let me build on the point I'm trying okay. to give you all the precepts nigga so you can know to go tell him right <laughs> so why would he be cutting him off if he agrees here that's the question you wouldn't do that if you agree with what he's talking about unless you were going to say yeah all right brother I agree with that I'm with you right that's how you would cut them off if you agree with it. You want to go talk about something you don't agree with, right? But right. instead, he's just cutting them off and trying to change the subject. Why? Because he don't agree with this at this point. But two months later, he presents this as if he knew this the whole time, as if he learned that at seminary school. No, you learned it from a 20-year-old on a street corner who was a Hebrew Israelite, nigga. Be real. 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So that's all those things. All those things like Isaiah 53, like Daniel 9. That's what makes you feel the law. Now, you mentioned something about Daniel. No, wait, 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 wait. Look, listen, it didn't just say, it didn't just say, huh? It didn't just say the law, because like he just said, it said the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, right? I said, I said the law, but no, I did not. I said the law, the prophets, the song. What is this showing you? This is showing you that he objected to the premise that Hassad built, yet two months later again, utilized the same scriptures. Look, Matthew 5 and 17, what does fulfilled mean? And went to Luke 24, 44 to 48. Man, all praises, man. All praise, y'all. And this nigga yeah. is exposed. For real. And they don't, like you said, they don't got to say thank you or nothing. We can clearly see what's going on. So, <laughs> and this guy went to seminary school. He's running around under the title of a doctor. Oh, man. He did one hell of a job, Asad. One hell of a job. Wow. You had a point, officer? Yeah. Um, are we going to go back to when he reads it in, uh, in uh, when he reads it at his little conference just now? Uh, where we at? 20, we only have, we only, no, nah, we're not going back to that. Okay. Okay. Because when he, family, watch the video. He reads Acts 3 and 18, and remember what he does? He says, see, simple, simple. Well, was it so simple when I, when I brought it to you? Devils, man. Proud, man. <laughs> nah, he's cold. He's a cold nigga for that. I ain't going to lie to you. That nigga man. cold for that. What a crook. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Right, listen, a real crook. Yeah, you're about to lose that chat. Oh man! All right, vocab. All right, vocab. <laughs> no problem. Now. I'm putting you in timeout now. All right. It, it's embarrassing that a doctor combated a 20 year old on a point that he then took the exact same formula of scriptures two months later and presented to his congregation as if he knew it the whole time. That's what's embarrassing. Come okay, on, you're such a devil. You wake up every day to fight against the truth. You're a demon for real, man. <laughs> <laughs> every day, you're sitting here looking right at this, and you still got something to say. That's how you know this. You know it, man. You. <laughs> he had me laughing, man. Are you kidding? Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. 
Where was he at? When I, where, 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 okay, you remember the roast of James White? You know you laughed at that too, man. Be real, man. But listen, the, James White laughed about his roast. Yeah, he thought it was hilarious. He's just mad because he can't read the Bible and, and have a good time doing it. It's so hard for him to understand anything about it. That's true. That's true. There's a lot of there's a lot of comedy in this book, man. You're gonna come and find that out. <laughs> hold on, okay, so let me hold on. Give me John 10 34. So let me John 10 34. Okay, I did. Okay, okay. I added I added. So okay, okay. Give me John 10 34. Okay, let's just see now he's saying it's 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 adding to God's word, yet still uses it to say that this explains fulfilling the law in Matthew 5 and 17. <laughs> But but you added to God's word, but this nigga didn't do it right here, right? So and that nigga, man, wow. That's crazy, bro. Wow. This was going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I didn't know he was doing it like this. This is Pastor Porkchop at his finest, hey, man. Look, like, like Ephraim Rising said, he thought he was just going to slip that on in. Uh, like, no one would ever know. Nah, nigga. You do a two-hour video on Israelite. Listen, it was hard for me. I didn't want to do it. I knew it was going to be crazy. <laughs> Assad had to come and fight me to get to watch this video. But I watched and I'm glad I did. Because, oh, God, I'm having a lot of fun killing you right now. Dude. Nah, I can't even oh, believe this, bro. Right. Hey, at least he ain't stupid. At least he knew. He When he was hearing Assad bring that out, he was like, damn. Hey, damn he's right. He's right. I need to. That's what I need to teach. <laughs> well, now, now I can get some precepts. Now I can, now I can get a reader. I can act like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I can crazy, pretend man. to be Israelite. Well, brother, you are Israelite. You need to repent. Yeah, be right. careful. Listen, we love you, brother. You just repent. You know, you can you can read for me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all about it, man. <laughs> for real. All right. Well, we at? Uh, okay, boom, boom. We did that. Where we at now? Okay, watch this. Uh, 125 and 35. The so-called Negroes or the Hebrew are the Hebrews of the Bible. Who else fulfills these prophecies? They'll ask you. Now that's not that's that's a horrible historical question. Mm -mm -mm. Who else fulfills them? Like, okay, have you studied history? Do you know how many people have experienced a lot of what's in Deuteronomy 28? But plenty of people have experienced some of what, but not all of what. Not an overwhelming majority of what's in Deuteronomy 28. That's the thing about that. Right. Not some of it. If you're only familiar with your with, with, with your own people, or you only talk to people like you, that's called ghetto. Mm. Mm. No, the real oh. meaning of ghetto isn't hood. It means surrounded by the same thing. So he's saying that we're ghetto, right? He he said that, your top, correct? I think so. Or ghetto now, now what let, let's just watch this and he doesn't realize what he did was put a nail in the coffin and prove the point <laughs> oh wait ghetto ghetto the part of the city in which jews are compelled to live <laughs> now watch how vocab tries to twist that watch this part of the city which jews are restricted uh where we at uh boom boom it comes from a clip form of Egypt. Wait a minute. Hey, we call America where we had the ghetto, and it means Egypt, right? So we came to Egypt, nigga, on a ship. Now watch this. Watch this. To crowded urban quarters to other minority groups, especially blacks in the U.S. Man. <laughs> These guys are idiots, man. <laughs> Not ridiculous. <laughs> so you're right. We are ghetto, nigga, and it answers all the other things that we've said tonight. <laughs> look at this nigga. Oh, take it. Look at him. <laughs> look at him. Man. <laughs> all right, now let's let's watch this. You better repent, Pastor. For your own sake, brother. You better lead that prideful spirit that that white man then gave you. Get the hell away from that devil no swag. Wait, well, hey, whatever you do in stat. Right. <laughs> now watch this. Watch, watch this nice try he tries to do. Watch this, y'all. And th and this is how you smack people that says Deuteronomy twenty eight and sixty eight already came to pass. Watch this. Uh, 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 Jerome the Great, one of the church fathers. It says after the last overthrow of the Jews by Adrian, many thousands were sold, and what could not be sold were transported into Egypt. It said. Now it says. Watch this. It, they're saying that this is the fulfillment of 68, right? right? Now it says 
you shall be sold in the you shall go uh, <laughs> buy and buy and be sold in Egypt, right? Right. But what would it, it it says <laughs> those that couldn't be sold went to Egypt. So the people that weren't sold, so we're not you're not going to Egypt to be sold. You that couldn't be sold were transported to Egypt, right? Now watch this. So when did they when did they go to Egypt? Well, how can they go to Egypt by ships? They say. Be First off, let, let me just keep playing this. Can't go to Egypt by ships. Why would you go from Egypt? Why would you go from Jerusalem to Egypt when you can walk from the interior? Uh, from yes, you can walk. You can go there on ship, right? But you don't need to go there on ship. That's our point. Not that it's impossible. But you're so historically stupid that you don't know that they were sold in slavery to Rome and those that were left over were sent to Egypt in that historical incident on a ship from Rome, not from Israel. You should have did that background research. From there to there, they, they brought them around the way in which you would never return. You, I said you would never go. They went by ships. How do we know? Because he says right here, and perish by shipwrecks. Wait, so they they those that couldn't be sold, according to this historical source that you're going to, that you claim debunks our understanding of Deuteronomy 20 and 68. It says we were sold into slavery. Then those of us that couldn't be sold were sent to Egypt by ship and died. You see what that says? And perished by shipwreck. So we were sent to Egypt, never got there because we died in Egypt. We died in shipwreck. So we never went into Egypt again on ships to be sold or to sell ourselves or whatever the hell you say that means. Right. Because this piece of history that you're going to says we didn't. It says we died in the water. You see, you see these people are stupid. When people try to tell you Deuteronomy 28, 68 already happened, this is what they're referencing. And um, we weren't slaves in Egypt. We died before we got there. And we were sent from Rome to Egypt, not from Israel. You, you didn't even do enough research to understand that about this part of history. But what's so cold is the Bible verse that they're using or the Bible version, it says that we would offer ourselves for sale, but there would be no buyers. But right here it says thousands were sold. Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, which one is it? So this isn't a fulfillment of that. It says people were sold right here. They don't say nothing about offering themselves for sales and nobody was there to buy them. And hey, listen, at all. Liars, man. Now, now, wa now watch this more retardation. This dude needs to give back that PhD. And fast. Do not follow worship to them. Do not serve them. Because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquities to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thought. What a liar. <laughs> What's wrong with video? That's the question. Go ahead and read it. Um, do not serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous These dudes talk so soft. The children for the fathers, <laughs> the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my command. Now, how many generations does God's hate last? I mean, that, that does God's uh, uh, discipline of his people last? Watch this. No, 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 no. Read exactly. Read what he said. Go ahead. Uh, do not follow and worship to them. Do not serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Stop. The third and fourth generation of those who what? Hate me. So, what if a generation stops hating him? He restores that generation. You're right, but this generation of us hasn't because people like you still are teaching this Christianity, which we got from the white man, which forces us into idolatry. So our generation hasn't stopped hating us. A minority of us have, but our generation has not stopped hating the most high in our idolatry. That hasn't happened. So, of course, it hasn't been lifted off of us. Genius. Let's keep going. So curses are not automatically continued to be imputed upon generations if there's repentance you're you're exactly right and where is the repentance you're still an idolatrous christian along with the vast majority of blacks and hispanics who are the israelites therefore the curses are remaining on our generations we're the ones trying to get the generational curse broke through repentance we're the actual ones doing that you guys are liars that's why there's no such thing as generational curses because you can stop 
and you repent and put it into it right there. You're right. So why don't you do it? So why don't you do you? It, but this guy admits that we're under a generational curse as a people by what we're going through. But he doesn't want to stop and repent and end the generational curse when he has ability to assist in that process with the congregation and the influence that he has amongst Christians. So you're the reason why this curse persists. And the interesting thing is he says that the curse can only go three or four generations. Well, then why was Israel cursed through the Babylonian, Medio persian Greek and Roman captivity? Liar. That's seven centuries worth of cursing, of being subjugated, of not having sovereignty, of being and of having to answer to a heathen nation that is idolatrous of Israel. Even if you don't believe we're the Israelites, that is the facts of the history of Israel. That's indisputable. Right. So we see that curse lasting longer than three or four generations. Liar. Wait a minute. Aren't the, aren't the Israelites scattered? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So like, I can hear you. I say, like, aren't the Israelites scattered? So, and have been scattered for years? And they got scattered. Four generations? Right. And they got scattered because they were under the curses. That was part of the curse to get scattered. So every day that they're scattered, they're under the curses. Exactly. What's going on? Salaki. So, yeah, uh, where we at? Go ahead, read that precept aside. And just because going back to the brother's point, how come this dude won't uh, repent and get, you know, us to, uh, was it uh, to get out of the generational curses? Lamentations 2 and 14. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity. Exactly. You're not teaching people that they're sinning and they need to stop doing it in order to be out of captivity and to break this curse. You're not teaching people that because you're teaching them that they don't have to keep this law. <laughs> so if you're the problem, you're the reason why this generational curse persists. You and those like you, black Christian pastors who are nothing but gatekeepers for white supremacy. Go ahead. But have seen for the false burdens and causes of banishment. See that? There we go. There we go. Simple. <laughs> in his voice, right? He's simple. Right, let's go here. Um, 145 10. And again, if anybody wants to watch this in totality, you go right here Epiphany Fellowship Engaging Hebrew Israelite. This is it. Take your own notes, do your own videos, your own rebukes. If you like, I encourage everybody to do it through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai as you're compelled. Got a precept, and, and also understand this because this is their attempt to this is them attempting to try to teach their people, their their followers, Christians, how to, like the brother Sergeant Yatai put, lie about the Bible. So it's good to study this because they're studying us. They're watching our videos and they're trying to find out how to combat us. So do the same. Study your adversary in this instance about how to combat them. Right. We're doing this for that same purpose. They're doing this to try to show people how to combat us. So now we're trying to give a guidebook on how you can respond to how they're going to try to combat you. Right. So go ahead, uh, Sergeant. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. Do you have that? Here you go. He's running. He's running all around that stage, but God did not send him. Go ahead. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Uh -huh. Here he is talking this stuff, but the Most High hasn't revealed none of this to him. A white boy did in the seminary school in Dallas, Texas. Go ahead. But if they had stood in my council and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from their evil doings. So how do you know if somebody's of God if they're teaching people to follow the law? <laughs> That's what that says right there. If you were of God, you would be t telling them to turn from their evil way. Their evil way is them breaking the law. Turning from your evil way is coming back to keeping the law, guarding it in your mind, and living it throughout your life and manifesting it in your flesh. That is what it is. So if you're not doing that, you're not of the most high. Read that part again, because that is a profound point through the spirit and power of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai. Go ahead. It says, it says, um, but if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then should they have turned them from their evil way 
and from their evil doings. So if you were of the most high, you'd be turning Israelites away from iniquity, meaning you would be telling them to stop breaking the law and start keeping it. If you were of the most high, if you don't do that, that is a clear case that you are not of God, period. Right. Go ahead. Or was that in on that? That's it on that. Come. Beautiful point. Let's go here. Now watch this. Watch this. That's what they used to say. They're going to enslave white people. Go ahead. Read it. What a devil. Read For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will choose Israel. Yeah. He will settle them on their own land. The resident alien will join and united with the house of Jacob. The nations will assure him, build and bring it to his own land. And the house of Israel will be they will make captives of their captives and will rule over their oppressors. Mm, good stuff. Now, they say this is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back. Yahweh is going to come back and destroy everything and they're going to be over their oppressors. The problem is when you read the Bible, these things have already been fulfilled. <laughs> right. now, he is a legendist, right? <laughs> now, now, let's keep going. Now, Grab the Isaiah passages for me. Every one of the Isaiah passages up there you see. Isaiah 13, 1, 17 through 19, and Isaiah 13, 17 through 19. That's up there, right? Uh, I got that twice. And then you go ahead and get that Daniel passage, the Daniel 5, 25, <laughs> Ezra 21, and, uh, uh, and, and... So I challenge anybody to read any of these verses, right? He says that this has already been fulfilled. <laughs> All of these verses are talking about us being saved out of the Babylonian captivity. Not one of these verses says that we possessed our oppressors and oppressed them or reigned over them or had them in slavery. Not one of these verses says that. So he lied by saying this has been fulfilled. We were saved out of Babylon, which it doesn't even talk about being saved out of Babylon. It just talks about we'd be saved and gathered out of all countries and the heathens would be there and be our slaves. That's what it says in Isaiah 14. So not one verse that he read proves that Isaiah 14 was fulfilled. And watch this. I'm going to show you how much of an idiot and a liar and a devil this nigga is, right? <laughs> He's got Isaiah 13 as a fulfillment of Isaiah 14 when it's a prophecy that comes before Isaiah 14, but that's supposed to be a fulfillment of the prophecy that's prophesied after? <laughs> what makes sense that in, the, in the, the, the fulfillment of a prophecy that doesn't exist is fulfilled in the previous chapter to it? You have to have a lot of, you have to think that the people, all you people at Epiphany Fellowship, I want you to understand that your pastor, your senior pastor, Eric Mason, thinks you're an absolute idiot. That's right. That's for telling you that the fulfillment of Isaiah 14 is in Isaiah 13. <laughs> <laughs> Man. He thinks you niggas are stupid. Man. And he wrote it twice as if it was two witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, the on I didn't even notice this till right now. Wait, nigga. Isaiah 14 is fulfilled in Isaiah 13. And you know, Mike Perea, he already knows faithful to Satan. He already knows what time it is with this, but he let Eric Mason go do this to himself. And, so and he's been working with Mike Perea. I know, I know when he said uh the guy I've been working with, he's been dealing with DP. He's probably the best way. I know he's talking about Mike. Yes, exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> and Mike and Mike uploaded this video knowing dang well this dude is getting ready to get put on the hot seat. Mike's sitting back laughing at this dude. He was like, I can't wait for these guys to get a hold of this guy. <laughs> man, you know, yes, Mr. Postman. You know Mike hates black people anyway. For real, he can't stand them, man. <laughs> so, of course, he said this black man up <laughs> with no problem. Mike's like, oh, I already know. They're about to gut him when he comes with that one. <laughs> oh, man. Unbelievable, man. <laughs> that this this is incredible. All praises, y'all by Shim Yah shout out the Lord. Because I didn't catch this that he tried to say Isaiah 13 was a fulfillment. I didn't see that until right now. That nigga got nerve. And like I said, it says that they're gonna possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. When did they have all these guys in captivity in the land of the Lord? And, it, and he's dealing with yet choosing Israel when only three tribes was back in the land during it. There's so much problematic. And again, you can read any of these verses that he said is a fulfillment. None of it speaks of, of us enslaving other nations. So that can't be the fulfillment because there's a part, a key part missing. Even if you contend that one part is fulfilled, which is not even fulfilled. But there's a key component missing, letting you know that it has not been fulfilled. Period. Right. And that's exactly what the Lord means when it says, woe to the pastors that scatter the sheep of my pasture, man. He's sitting in front of a room full of people blatantly lying to him. 
telling them, nope, these guys are wrong. They're saying they're using this scripture right here to say they're going to have white people in slavery. But this already happened. This guy's literally lying with a doctor's degree in front of him with that title. <laughs> Look at this dude, man. Yeah, why is why is he posting like like presets? Didn't he tell me that you, you have to read, you have to start from the top, you have to read the entire book, but he's got right. like five, right. five to thirty. Why don't you what's Daniel five to one? They they love isogeny scripture until they see someone else do it and then they call them out for it. They right. love taking things out of context. They love just reading one to two verses here and there. But if you do it, it's a crime. You're taking it out of context. You got to read the whole thing. Look, so I, this is why I suggest, too, for everybody out there, if you interface with these people and they try to uh, when you go precept upon precept and they try to make, bring accusation to you for it, what you do is you wait for them to do. Don't even go to Isaiah 28. We'll wait for them to do it and go, wait, I thought we weren't supposed to do that. Right. You know, OK. And then just call them on and say, I don't have a problem with you doing it, but you can't object to me doing it because you do it, too. And if you object to me doing it, you're a damn hypocrite, period. Right. Yeah. And ask him what John three and fifteen says, or what John three and seventeen says, or anything except John. Right. <laughs> anything in John the third chapter. <laughs> three and fourteen. What that's about? Right. Read the whole thing. Feel me? That's crazy. Now, uh, watch this. Now, well, watch this. This and this is the last point I got. Watch this. What was your last thing you asked, sir? Oh, the apocrypha. Well, it, I mean, the apocrypha. The Jews didn't even view the apocrypha as it's, it's Bible. So when you look at I me, mean, that's just a real, that's an easy one. That's it. You see how he just, he just yeah. took the apographer and waved it off. But watch this. Watch what he says earlier on in this lecture. Right? He says, you know, it, it, the Jews didn't even accept it. So, you know, it, 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 that's an easy one. Right? Now, watch this. Watch this. We on him. Watch this. Slavery is actually a biblical a way that they should be functioning and living in, which is fully demonic. Right? That someone would take away from the word of God in order to keep people from being changed by the word of God. He said it's demonic that people would take away from the word of God in order to keep people from being changed by the word of God. Yet you're dismissing the apocrypha. Yet the apocrypha was a part of the word of God for over 150 years. Then someone took it out. Devil. Hmm. <laughs> you see how that works against you? Oh, and on top of that, Pastor Eric Mason, who you believe is your Messiah. He quoted the Apocrypha. Let's read that now. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which I sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Mm, okay, let's see if where he got that from. Read. Second Ezra 1 and 30. I gathered you together as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings. See that? He got that from the Apocrypha. That's what he was quoting. So doesn't that automatically make it inspired of Christ Hamashiach Yahushua quoted it? See that? So all praise Yahweh by Shem Yahushua. This guy's been thoroughly gutted like the pig he is because he is what he eats, right? Um, been thoroughly gutted through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahushua, roasted like a rotisserie, um, like they do on the Polynesian islands. And um, I think it's very clear here in the spirit who God is dealing with, who knows the Bible and who doesn't, the babes and not the wise. Any uh, any closing statement, Sergeant Guitar? Yeah, I just want to know, Pastor uh, Mason. Are you a Mason? I just want to know, man. You know, that's a funny name, last name. And your middle name starts with an M. Eric M. Mason, middle name Master. Somebody chime in on that, man. <laughs> yeah, because that, that that's inquiry minds would love to know. <laughs> would love to know. Oh my goodness gracious, man! Uh, I hope y'all hey, enjoy. Go ahead. Uh, so lucky, man. Hey, man, no skinny jeans, man. <laughs> no skinny jeans. Man. For the sake of the woman you love, no skinny jeans. <laughs> you're embarrassing her. <laughs> you're embarrassing black people with them jeans, man. <laughs> you know, you're a total embarrassment. Come on, man. I know he's from the same city as little Izzy Vert, but damn. <laughs> 50 year old skinny jeans, man. <laughs> Unbelievable. Man, uh, but yeah, man, with that, I uh, hope y'all enjoyed, man. To water everybody tuning in. Hope y'all were edified. To water all the super chatters. Can you how about Shem Yahweh Shah Barak? A thumb to y'all. Um, we're going to give all praises, honor, and glory to Abba Nawi Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shah and say Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.